Okay, welcome to the first meeting of 2023. It's Tuesday, January the 17th, and we're about to go in camera. So uh, in camera, we'll be in our committee room one where we discuss matters that cannot be uh, discussed in open, and then we will be returning to the regularly scheduled agenda of the, of the council meeting. So I am looking for a motion to go in camera, moved by Councillor Thompson, second by Councillor Patel. If there's no discussion to that, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that's unanimous. We're now going to reconvene in camera, and we will be returning afterward and continue with the regular scheduled meeting. Thank you.
All right, welcome everyone to the first city council meeting of 2023 and we've got a full gallery and I know they're all here because of the mayor's announcements that I'm doing a little later. Everyone gets excited, especially uh, council when I do my, uh, my every council meeting. I do, I'm kidding, I know you're here for some acknowledgements. So let's get started. We already had our in-camera meeting uh, a little bit earlier. So the first thing we're gonna do, we're gonna call the meeting to order and it's gonna start with the singing of O Canada. And I believe, I'm just checking my uh, notes here. Is it a pre-recorded though? No. Uh, oh, here it is, I'm sorry. Here we go, I got it. Okay, so we've got Ella. Is Ella here, where's Ella? Okay, there's Ella, okay, great. So first off, I'm gonna do the introduction, then I'll ask everyone to stand, and uh, we'll listen and uh, show respect to our flag and our country. So Ella Sacco will be singing today. She'll be doing today's performance of our national anthem. She's a grade nine student at St. Paul. She's in the French Immersion Program there and involved in many extracurricular activities. She plays junior girls basketball and volleyball and is a member of the Vocal Ensemble. Ella has danced with Infinity Motion Dance Studio since she was three years old. She's performed in many location productions with Linus Hand. She's looking forward to taking part in a student exchange where she'll be traveling to France this March with eight other students from her board. That sounds exciting. We're very excited that she could find some time to be with us this evening to sing the national anthem. So I'd ask if everyone could please stand. And your microphone is on, Ella, so whenever you're ready, honey. Okay. Oh, Canada, our home and native land, true patriot love in all of us command with glowing hearts we see thee rise the true north strong and free from far and wide O oh Canada we stand on guard for thee. A valeur de foi trompe protégera no foyers et no So Ella, I just want to say on behalf of everybody here, well done, that was fantastic. And for anyone watching, it's hard enough to sing, never mind to do it in front of a whole bunch of people and a bunch of people on TV as well. You nailed it, you did your school proud. We're really happy that you're able to and I'm sure you did that French part just to prepare for your trip to France, right? Yeah. How about a big hand for Ella? Great job. <laughs> Now, Ella, you're welcome to hang around. It's gonna be a very riveting meeting. Um, and, but if you don't, I understand. And no, we don't have a, yeah, thanks very much, folks. Thank you. Appreciate Thank you. that, yeah, yeah. No, 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 you guys go, no problem. But don't run, though, just walk. And now we've got a few extra seats. Uh, if anyone would like to grab some of these seats, by all means, go right ahead. Yeah, come on, don't be shy. This way, if you guys come in, more people come, come in the room. We've got seats for about eight people. And no, this is not our new chief administrative officer. This is our regional counselor, Kim Crater, who uh, there's no seats in the house, so he's gonna sit right next and uh, get a good bird's eye view of what's going on today. Keeping so, an eye on there. Yes, keeping an eye on me, which is a good idea. Okay, now, first order of business, I'd like to ask for an adoption of the minutes from December 13th meeting. Moved by Councilor Peter Angelo, second by Councilor Campbell. Is there any discussion to the minutes? Seeing none, all those in favor? Okay, and that's approved, thank you for that. Are there any disclosures of a pecuniary interest? I've got Councillor Peter Angelo, and then Councillor Lococo, and then Campbell. Thanks, Your Worship, 8.3 PBD, 2023-03, Grassy Brooks Secondary Plan. My family owns lands within close proximity. 
8.4 PBD 2023-04 and attach the to that as well is 13.2 a resolution to council it's a modification of a draft plan of vacant land condominium my family members uh, can be affected financially um, under communication your worship there's a number of them that deal with bill 23 and my family owns land that can be affected it's 11.1 2 5 7 8 9 and 10 i'll give this to the clerk okay thank you for that councillor camel thank you your worship uh, with respect to the Hart Niagara presentation, uh, that's uh, 6.3, no, I'm sorry, 6.2. Uh, I participate in their exercise program and my wife, Helga, uh, is chair of the board. Okay. Thank you for that. Councilor LaCoco. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I do not have a conflict, but I was wondering if we could do the land acknowledgement. We skipped it. Oh. Thank you. Yes, we did. My apologies. Yes, we did. Okay, so do you have any other, do you have a disclosure of pecuniary interest? Are there any other disclosures of pecuniary interest? Okay, seeing none, Mr. Clerk, we missed it. So we will ready the screens. Our land acknowledgement, traditional indigenous meeting opening. We acknowledge and thank the indigenous peoples who were stewards of this land for a millennia before us. We'd like to welcome Brian Kahn, who's a local artist of Métis descent and an advocate in the Indigenous community to share his testimony. Tansi, Brian Khan, Natishika Shan, Niagara Falls, Nowicki, Metaniska Wakamakanak, Ilene Wak, Mushka Gaywak, Ekwamiti. So, hello and greetings to all. My name is Brian Khan. I live in Niagara Falls, but my ancestors, they come from the north, from the far north. They are the Muscri, and I am Metis. So, I'm going to start the, the meeting today with what is known as a traditional opening. And we don't know what, what your day was like as, you, as everyone gathers here in the meeting. Um, somebody might, may have had a fight with a, a spouse member or someone may have cut them off uh, as they were driving to the meeting. So if we all come together in a good way and a good mind and think of all the great gifts that have been given to us by the Creator. So with that, I call to Kisimanto, the Great Spirit, the Creator. And we are thankful to Him for all of the gifts that He has given to us. And the greatest of those gifts is the gift of Mother Earth. And through her, we are given additional gifts, plants and medicines that grow from the ground. And we are grateful to each. Of them, for they nourish us mm -hmm. and they heal us. as we continue through our journey. We're grateful to the Tree Nation because the Tree Nation, the trees stand tall and proud. Do you have any insight from our IT? And they provide us with the materials to make our homes. Traditionally, they provided the, the materials to build our fires for staying warm and for our ceremonies. The trees and the forests and the lands are also a place for all the two-legged, the four-legged, the swimmers, the crawlers, the flyers, and we are grateful to each and every one of, of them. And when I think of, of all of those gifts that the Creator has given to us for us to use, we got, must be reminded that as we come across item that we want to harvest, that we don't take the very first one that we see, whether it's a plant or an animal. We don't even take the second one that we see. It's not until we find the third that we realize that there is enough for those who follow behind us, whether it's those who follow the next day or those who follow for generations to come. And those are the teachings of my ancestors. We are grateful for the four winds that blow and the four directions that surround us. With that, that brings the change of season and new opportunities. At this time, it is a time of harvesting of those plants. And with that, we take one of the sacred medicines, tobacco, and we lay it on the ground as a gift to, to Mother Earth for giving us that opportunity to grow and, and nourish that plant or that medicine, which ultimately comes back to us. So we're grateful uh, for that harvest that we have. Living in Niagara, we're surrounded by water and the water is so important, it makes up a good part of our body. And 
It also uh, provides us with refreshment throughout the day. But more importantly, it is through water that we have our very first homes. Before we were born, we lived within water within our mothers. So we're grateful to that water. I look to the sky and I see Brother Sun. He's out there and he provides us with light and warmth. Whether he's shining bright or whether hidden behind the clouds, he's there and we know he's there and we are grateful to him. At the night skies, Grandmother Moon, she shines high and strong and bright. And we are grateful for, for the gifts that she brings to us. But with that, we are grateful how she influences our bodies and influences the waterways so that through Grandmother Moon, through the water, and through the women of our nations, that our future generations are born, we are grateful. And finally, I look to the night sky and I see the stars that are up there. And I am told that those stars are our ancestors. They're watching over us, they're guiding us, they're leading us along our journey. And so with that, I will say hi, hi. Thank you, merci, merci, miigwech. Thank you very much and thank you for your patience. We had some technical glitches during that. So thank you to Brian Kahn, a local artist of Métis descent and an advocate in the indigenous community sharing his testimony. Um, just before we get started, and the reason that you're all here for your presentations, we just quickly get through a very brief uh, mayor's remarks and announcements, starting off with some obituaries. Um, we mourn the passing of John Audibert, brother of retired firefighter Fred Audibert, uh, passing of Carol Reese, mother of Kira Dolch, our general manor of, manager of planning. Uh, Raymond Woodhead, the father of Bob Woodhead, in our arena operations, and the passing of Peter Gordon, the illumination operator at the illumination tower for 54 years. Um, we did have some, or we do have some birthdays coming up. So, uh, Councillor Ruth Ann Newestag, January the 19th, coming up on Thursday. Uh, regional, what's that? She's turning 40, yes, that's what I understand. Uh, Councillor Joyce Morocco, Regional Councillor, is going to be this Saturday, the 21st, and as well, Serge Felicetti, our Director of Business Development, on Saturday as well. Some recognition of storm assistance by our community. We'll all remember the, the blizzard that we had just prior to Christmas. Uh, that was the 23rd and 24th of December. And much of our city and neighboring communities were snowed in. Many families were without power or they didn't have the ability to travel through Christmas. Our staff really stepped up and we wanted to acknowledge them and we had a bunch of people here to, to hear this. Uh, several of our staff were called into work on Christmas Day, not only doing snow removal, but to cover the shelters in town and to cover the hours so those in need didn't have to be displaced by the storm. Some of our staff volunteered on Christmas Day, including, but not limited to, Trent Dark, Dave Etherington, Tachana Jalufka, and our CAO, Jason Burgess. I'd like to say a, a great big thank you to our staff for doing that on, on Christmas Day and volunteering their time. So if we could just acknowledge that. And as well, lots of local businesses made hundreds of sandwiches to help feed the service workers, the first responders, those without power, people in the shelters, and people in neighboring communities. We're very grateful for those donations. We'd like to thank the Four Points Sheraton, Ruth's Chris Steakhouse, Falls View Casino, Hilton Niagara Falls, and Falls View Hotel and Suites. Uh, they were very kind to donate all of this food so that everybody would be able to eat during the storm. And finally, the incredible team at Niagara Peninsula Energy, our local utility, were instrumental in helping our neighbors throughout the perils of this storm. And I'd like to ask Mike Strange uh, if he'd maybe share a few words as one of our board members on NPEI. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And along with uh, Councillor Thompson, we sit on the MPI and we had a recent board meeting. And, and uh, you know, during the storm, it was, you know, I reached out to, you know, because I live in the north end and we had a little bit of gust of wind and something, but people, and I was like, what did everyone complain about in the south end? But, you know, apparently, you know, I talked to CEO and it's like the tale of two cities because, you know, just south of McLeod Road was just insane. And, um, and you go towards uh, the lake and, and Port Coburn, Fort Erie, Wayne Fleet. Uh, it was just it was just something else it, compared to 19 the blizzard of 1977 so we went and we had a meeting and and it was unbelievable the what the workers did and the line workers and the communication everything in the npi it was the service was unbelievable they were going out south end and and some of the pictures i don't know if anyone can see the trees were down the winds were 120 kilometers an hour 
And you saw some of these line workers in the bucket trucks fixing the power. It was just crazy. Because you understand, you know, that goes out and then, you know, your heat goes out and then, you know, down in Wave Fleet and stuff, you know, the pipes were bursting. And after they finished everything, and the, the safety obviously with, with the wind and everything, we, they went out and they assisted our neighbor utility, Canadian Niagara Power, uh, CNP, CNP, and they went over and, uh, and, and dispatched nine power line crews and eight trucks to assist CNP with the restoration of efforts in Port Colborne, Wayne Fleet, Ridgeway, Crystal Beach, and Fort Erie. So I just want to acknowledge our utility here, NPI, and just the wonderful work they did. So. Um, <laughs> Thank you to all who took part. That's the kind of community Niagara Falls is. And I'd like to thank the city representatives at a number of events, Councillor Neustag for representing the city at the Niagara Falls History Museum book launch, and Councillor Thompson representing the city at the Niagara Military Museum New Year's Levy. Uh, a couple last things. Uh, you look uh, to the screens. We had the Miss All Canadian pageant contestants who were acknowledged, and you see a bunch of pictures there. Uh, they came to City Hall to be acknowledged. We had the Niagara Ice Wine Festival Gala. I was joined by Councillor Strange at that event this weekend at the Niagara Parks Power Station. And if you have not had a chance to check that place out, it is incredible. And that event was unbelievable. So thank you uh, for those of you joining us. We had a grand opening recently, um, Coop Wicked Chicken. I was joined by most of Council. We had Councillor Strange, Patel, Newestag, Peter Angelo, and Baldinelli. We could have almost had a meeting that day. And uh, really good food down on the corner of McLeod Road and Drummond. Excellent. And lastly, our next council meeting will be next Tuesday, which will be the 24th, which will be a budget meeting. So now we can get on with business of why you're all here. And we're going to get started first off with the 2022 Thundercat Select Team. And just read this really quick as we get started. So 2022 was an unprecedented year for Niagara Falls Thundercats girls softball teams. We had four teams win gold in their divisions at the Ontario Select Softball Tournament, OSSTA. What a great accomplishment for the club. What a fantastic achievement for these players, their coaches, and their families. The gold winners in their divisions were U13 Squirt Select, U15, Novice Select, U17, Bantam Select, and U19, U21, Midget Select. We even had an honorable mention in the U11 Select Girls who finished the Provincials with a bronze medal. So this time I'd like to invite the groups one team at a time, and we're going to introduce the coaches. The coaches will call up the players. We're going to give you a little bit of a takeaway, a memento of today and appreciation of City Council and the City of Niagara Falls for this great accomplishment for girls softball. So first up, if I can invite Kathy Brady, Simon Adamson, and Wendy Bateman, if you'd please come up here and join me. And there's a little gate right there, right in that corner. Might have to move that jacket, I think. There you go. Yeah. team up one at a time. We'll give each of them their, their um, plaque. And then what we'll do, we'll stop here so if moms or dads or whoever wants to take a picture, you can come right up to the rail if you like or stand up or whatever. Take a picture, we'll wait, shake their hand, and we'll come and see the coaches. Then we'll do a, a group shot with each team. Does that sound good? Yeah. Any questions? Yeah. Okay, no? no? Okay, we'll get started. Okay, Wendy. So I don't miss anyone. Can you use your team stand up, please? We're going to start with Alana. Come on up. Alana Fife. Fife.
Sawyer Adamson. Coaches, maybe you want to just say a few uh, words about the season, uh, any experiences you want to share, then we'll do the group shot. Okay, um, this season we started our season with um, 12 players um, coming out of sort of some seasons that have been disturbed from COVID. So we knew we had some talent, we didn't quite know exactly just how much talent. So um, we fought some injuries throughout the season, we went into five tournaments. Our first, first one we picked up was at fourth place, and then after that, a third place, and after that we went into four other tournaments, so across uh, the province, and we picked up gold after gold after gold, and I think one of the coolest things is these girls stuck together. No matter what, out on the diamond, it didn't matter who was coming to the plate, they went up there with all the confidence in the world and just hit, 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 hit. Um, our final game, I think, was 14 um, nothing for provincial gold, which I couldn't be prouder of these girls. There was a huge defensive play where we pulled a double play or a triple play. <coughs> From the outfield, out to third, out to second, everything was clicking, everything was firing. Um, one of the coolest things was um, our final game was actually against uh, Northwest London, which was actually coached by ex-major leader Jeff Francis. So he's an inductee of the Canadian Baseball Hall of Fame. Um, and one of the things he had to say is our girls won and they won with the class. So congratulations ladies. <laughs> good job coach. That was good. And we've got blacks for the coaches. So smile this Coaches, get in there, coaches. We're going to get the. Wendy's not in there. Hold on, stay still, guys. We got more pictures. Good, there we go. Oh, one more. You good? All right, have a big hand for these girls. Now you ladies, you're welcome to hang around. It's going to be an exciting council meeting. Hey, next team I'd like to call up is going to be the U15 Novice Select Gold Winners. So first off, as we did earlier, we're going to invite the coaches up to say a few words about their gold medal finish. So maybe Sean and Stephanie Irish. Okay. 
so uh, so the coaches are going to call the players up, and maybe it's a good idea. So if maybe we can get all the U15 Nava Select gold winners to stand up, and the coaches will call your names. I'll meet you right here, present you the plaque, take the quick picture, come here, coaches will say a few words, and we'll do a group shot. Right? Sound good? All right, that's what we'll do. All right. All right, so we'll call them Ty season and the experiences, what you learned, and uh, the points of interest for all of our fans here. Yeah. Um, so these 13 young ladies uh, came together this year and really gelled well uh, as a team. They all play for each other. There's no individuals on this team. They all go out there and fight hard on that field. Um, there's some scrapes and cuts, and some blood, sweat, and tears on those fields for sure. Uh, but these girls really played hard all season. Uh, we went 21-1-1. One, one, and one and uh, came home with gold medals in all of our tournaments. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> consolation gold. <laughs> um, they call it consolation gold, but we were in the tournament. So anyways, um, but yeah, just a really great season. Uh, coming off COVID, they worked really hard to get back into shape to be on the diamonds, and uh, looking forward to this year, getting ready to start up again. I want a big hand for the team and the coaches. Sorry. 
I know I've got three kids, and I know what's involved in rushing them, getting them food, getting them practice, getting everything done, getting them to the games, and all the fans that come and cheer them on. I want a big fan for all of you for making them. Thank you. that we've done tonight. So we are now going to be doing the U17 Bantam Select Gold Winners. First thing I'd like to do is call the coaches up here. We've got Brett Bynon, BJ Wincott, <coughs> and Amanda St. Angelo. But there's a gate right there, sir. We're at the end there. Or you can do that scissor kick down here if you like. <laughs> it works for you. Oh no. Come on. Congratulations. Okay. Congratulations. So what we're gonna do is I'm gonna ask the coaches to introduce the team. You're gonna come up through that same gate. We'll meet right here. I'll give you your plaque. We'll shake, take a picture. If there's a family member who wants to take a picture, and then we'll stand here. The coaches, when we're done, everybody will say a few words about the season, and then we'll do a group shot. Does that sound good? Awesome. Now the last group agreed that they pay $5 a picture. If you're still <laughs> 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 Kidding. 
Hey, coaches, so I'll tell you what we'll do. So can we get the U17 to stand up, the Mantum Select to stand up, make it easy on the coaches? <coughs> Tasha Riddick, come on up. Sophia Cavelli. Points of interest, anything that we'd all be really interested to hear about? Um, yeah, a great group of girls. Uh, most of these girls have been together for a few years. Um, started with, with pretty high expectations, and uh, uh, and they came through. We, we've been uh, you know practicing together for a few years, and uh, it started at the bottom. Uh, you know, most of these girls remember when when we we uh, we had trouble competing a few years ago. Uh, so well earned, well earned for, for these girls. Um, had a great season, um, won four out of five tournaments that we, we entered, uh, went uh, undefeated in provincials, won a, won a nail, bite, nail biter in the final game uh, against a real strong North Bay team that was also undefeated uh, prior to, to facing us. Um, wanted to, to thank um, Amanda, uh, um, who, who was one of our coaches, and, and certainly uh, the, the, the role model for, for uh, this group of, of teenagers. Uh, Amanda played uh, in the Niagara Girls Minor Softball Association a couple of years prior, um, and, and was just a, an inspiration to them. Uh, taught them more about baseball than, than I could have, uh, uh, for sure. Our other coach, BJ Wincott, um, just truly dedicated. Uh, had, had to miss tonight because he's in a flight delay. Uh, he, he sent me a note, wanted to tell you girls how proud he was. Um, and really, the, for him, the, the, the thing about the team was Every girl uh, on this team really contributed, and um, you all had your moments where you stepped up and made critical plays or, or big hits. Um, Eleven girls on this team, a couple couldn't make it tonight. Every one of them was awarded uh, at some point during the year a, a team uh, MVP, which would be awarded by the other team. So it wasn't us choosing. Uh, the other teams recognized uh, individual contributions and really came together as a team. Uh, as a coach, um, you know what, what I hope you girls take uh, uh, from from this year is, you know, you were you were awarded your championship medals in North York, but you, you really earned it in, in the year before with in the gym and on the diamond, with the work ethic, uh, the dedication. Take that with you, you know, in, in school, in work, um, and and know that you know the same way that you achieved your goal here, you, you'll achieve a lot uh, uh, moving forward if you if you hang on to those characteristics. I'm proud of you. Thank you. 
25 years in these girls not only represented what softball is as a sport, uh, but they represented what it is to all women who play sports. And they've developed friendships and um, you know, they're a sisterhood that's going to last for years. I have been in this, this situation for many years and I still call my girls my family. And throughout the year, working with these girls, it's been a privilege to see that this, they have become a family. And that's exactly why we come as coaches to see what you guys have become. So I'm very proud to, to stand here with you guys and, and be your coach and to see you all come together like this. Awesome. Team picture, if anyone wants to come forward, we'll take a group shot. Mm -hmm. And by the way, there will be plaques for the girls that couldn't be here today. And BJ. <laughs> He only took 10 shots already. You think it's easy sucking your gut in that long? It's not. <laughs> and I want to also say, this goes beyond just sport. These young ladies are the leaders of tomorrow. And it's about character development. It's going to help them in their jobs and their careers. It goes way beyond baseball, way beyond sport. You're developing, developing these people, these citizens, these amazing people. So big hand for the coaches and the players. <laughs> Same thing through the little doorway here. If I can have Mike Leak and Jim Barrett to please join me up here. Barrett, <laughs> sorry. A lot of pressure. So what I'd ask is if I could please get the uh, Midget Select Gold Winners to stand up and then your coaches are going to call you one by one and then work your way down this way or that way through this gateway. We're going to stop here, do the picture, smile, do the picture, and then you'll join your coaches here and then we'll do a group shot afterwards. Everybody got that? And anybody wants to take pictures, you can walk right up to the front here if you like as well. Okay, we're all set coaches whenever you're ready. Look at me, baby. Two traditions. Mag Barrett. My eyes were close. Like, <laughs> I'm on Bates. Thank <laughs> you. 
by the president. Something else? <laughs> Charlie Colley. So, uh, so coaches, uh, and not Barrett, it's Barrett, sorry. Maybe you'll maybe share a few words, a little bit about the season, the character development, uh, any stories, points of interest that you might want to share with everybody about the season, how we got here today. Uh, this was actually a special win for these girls, because a lot of these girls, this was their very last year playing in this league. Uh, a lot of these girls we've coached since they were just little kids. Now they're actually adults now. So going into that tournament, uh, <coughs> we had a couple of tournaments we didn't fare too well in. Uh, once the provincials came along, we had 10 girls that played every minute of every game. We had two pitchers we went through the whole weekend. The girls still went 6-0. Like, I couldn't be any more proud of these girls. Like, they just, it was a nice way to end their careers as, uh, as ball players. Okay, ready? On three. One, two, three. Again, one, two, three. I'm coming to I'm the loud one, yeah. Maybe you like the dog right here. <laughs> Beauty. Awesome. So ladies, big hand, and you know it's funny, you see as they get older, they're smaller teams, because they're working, right, they've got other things that they're, that they're dealing with, but, and I know I've got two daughters as well to went through the sports, that it was hard when they finished, right, that stopped when you come to the end, but I want to say, on behalf of the city, on behalf of city council, we're very proud of these young ladies, the families who supported them, the coaches who volunteer their time. They're busy, but they come out to do this. They, they are very engaged, and, and we're trying to develop. It's character development more than anything. So these are going to be great contributing members of our community, and sport teaches so much more than just the sport. So on behalf of the city, I want to say thank you to all of you. Thank you to our champions, and thank you for all the work and effort that everybody put into it. So thank you very much. <laughs> Now you're all welcome to stick around. <laughs> If it's one thing I think that we've missed over the last few years because of COVID is something I haven't seen this in probably three or four years. Yeah. And it's, it's really nice to get that back and, and seeing what the power of sport brings to these, uh, these young athletes and, and watching them uh, be leaders. It's awesome. Awesome. Totally agree. Yeah. Thanks for that, Councillor Strange. Thank you for that. Okay, folks, moving along on our agenda. We're at item 6.2, Heart Niagara. So I welcome up Karen Stern, Executive Director of Heart Niagara, who's requesting to speak to council, thanking the municipality for ongoing support. So welcome. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Karen Stern and I'm from Heart Niagara. Uh, and really, uh, my decision to come to council was really just to, to give you all some good news about how great we are as a community 
however to follow that. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. So really uh, exciting just to remind us what we're doing. Let me just tell you, the hardest part of a presentation is figuring out the PowerPoint. <laughs> so, oh, did we go to slideshow? Right. Yep, we got our IT people uh, to help you out. There we go. Okay. So really, um, Hart Niagara, we've been around for uh, 45 years plus, and um, we're really here because of this community and what you've done. But I just want to remind people of some things about heart disease and the reason why we're here, and that is one in 12 Canadians by the age of 20 are diagnosed with heart disease. And every hour, 14 Canadians with diagnosed heart disease die after the age of 21. So prevention is where it starts. You know your risks, and nine in 10 Canadians have at least one risk factor for heart disease and stroke. And almost 80% of premature heart disease and stroke can be prevented with healthy behaviors. So that means eating healthy, being physically active, living smoke-free. This is a big impact on your life. So we're here tonight just to show our gratitude for the support you've all provided us and remind you of the success that we've had thanks to the focus and that really is investing programming into reducing the risk and risk factors of heart disease so we can have a heart healthy Niagara. The other part of our job has always been about preparing this community to respond in case of emergency. So originally we supported the development of 911 and started with CPR and ACLS and um, in the Niagara region in the 70s. However, we've lived through and continued to build that for the last 45 years. I can't even tell you how many people we've been able to train in CPR over the years, but annually we train over 5,000 people. So continue that over 45 years. My math's pretty good, but it's certainly over 250,000 people we've made an impact on. We've also brought together healthcare in Niagara. We've made sure through education and training so that people have more of a sense of community within our healthcare community. We've continued to provide coverage at mass community events over the years, whether it's been marathons or community festivals. And we know we were the early recognizers due to our leadership from Dr. Stafford Dobbin around cardiac rehab and we were the first in the province. We were seeing uh, 600 families a year in four sites. And that program is now delivered by the NH. <clears throat> so Hart Niagara's board leadership established programming around community public access defibrillation. And under that leadership, our staff and our uh, community partners, we've placed over 700 defibrillators in the Niagara region in the last uh, 20 years. And we continue to work with that. And we wanted to support Niagara Emergency uh, EMS, and uh, that's with providing more education so that when you call 911, they're able to direct you to where the defibrillator is in the community. And Heart Niagara has done that in the Niagara region. We continue to do that, and we have 850 defibrillators in our registry that we share with 911 dispatch. So annually, of course, our Healthy Heart Schools program, we see 5,000 students in secondary and elementary schools every year. The last couple of years we had some changes, so we had a lot more digital resources to support teachers. However, I'm happy to say that in the first four months we've seen 1,100 kids in schools again this year, so life is getting back to normal. Our goal in schools is really to invest in Niagara families, and that's because the school boards and teachers and educators support us as we can remind kids about making individual health choices that are positive to reduce their future risk. And the Niagara, the data that we've um, developed through the schools and been able to collect over the years, we've been able to support researchers in Ontario and in Canada. And to date, we have 39 publications in Canada. One of the things that we've moved to is really supporting active transportation and specifically cycling. It's the solution to increase cardiovascular health. It reduces isolation. It supports our environment and makes us better prepared as a community to lean in and build a better sense of community. What we've done in the, through the COVID time is certainly develop uh, cycling rodeo videos to make sure that people know about cycle safety and we have that in English, French and Spanish now. And of course, everyone recognized the need for strength and resistance training to increase core strength, our mobility and our flexibility, which will reduce your risk factors of heart disease, but will help us 
age a little graceful. So HeartCore is a program that we developed here in Niagara. It's unique. You come twice a week for 20 minutes, one-on-one -on -one coaching, and we also offer fitness classes within the program. So we're really proud of it, and we hope more people will take us up. And then, of course, we've been continuing to strengthen our responsiveness in workplaces and in the community by offering standard first aid training. We train over 500 people a year in standard first aid. One of the things that Hart Niagara did uh, in the early days was respond to the need for timely testing. So we continue to have a diagnostic program for Niagara residents, which includes echo sonography and Holter's monitors. It's one of the programs we developed because a nonprofit and a charity, we, didn't, we wanted to find a way to do business and provide support services. And so we've been very successful thanks to Niagara healthcare providers. And of course we have a cardiovascular risk reduction clinic. That clinic is to support each and every one of us on our journey to better health. So if you need uh, some su support, pardon me, please consider coming to Heart Niagara to reduce your risk factors of heart disease. And Heart Niagara always believes in paying it forward, and I think many of you know that about us. So we support a number of the groups that will be here tonight. Uh, we find a way to do what's necessary, and we as an organization lean in, and we can only do that with our community partners. So what am I here to ask for tonight? Isn't everybody always here to ask something? So my ask really is, what you can do is lead by example. You can be more active. You can walk the talk. Think about your food. Eat local, eat well, and manage your portions. And of course, live smoke and vape free. What you can do for your community is certainly get your CPR training done annually. Notice where the defibrillators are, the AEDs in your community, and know how to respond in case of emergency. And of course, volunteer in our community to whatever organization you want because it's good for your heart. And what you can do for Heart Niagara is share our message in our social media. This month, uh, for Heart Month this year, we have a unique way and we're going to have a silent auction online. And the first uh, donation we received was one week in Turks and Caicos. So we have a four bedroom, uh, executive home uh, on the silent auction and we're getting experiences and vacations all the time we know that just getting together as a family is the best way to do it so we're doing that with our silent auction so check out our uh, on-site location also on February 8th we are participating in artistic journeys which is at Brock University in the Shauna Sullivan Theatre and that will be plays, poems, and artwork, which really will describe how people feel about heart disease and how their symptoms feel, and doing it in a different way. And of course, you can always donate to Heart Niagara, and that will help us continue the work we do in Niagara. And really what you can do for yourself is know your risk of heart disease and manage your risk every day. It doesn't matter. Heart disease doesn't discriminate by age. Here's a few of the funds and the people that supported us in 2022. There's many, many more, but we just want to say thank you. And of course, we're grateful. We're grateful to, the, to everyone for the over 5,000 people in Niagara that we were able to serve this year, thanks to all the programming. So thank you. We were coming to see you for happy holidays for Christmas. We didn't see you in December, but really, it's Valentine's Day and Heart Month in February, so happy holidays. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Karen. Uh, we've got uh, Councillor Thompson like to say a few words. Yes, thanking. Um, so nice to see Karen here and uh, talking about um, Health Niagara. I have spent um, supporting uh, at least 45 years um, and one of my best friends was Dr. Uh, Stafford Dobbin. He was the creation of this. He was a doctor, not a heart doctor, but he came up with the uh, idea and he has um, affected so many people with health, uh, the health of uh, the heart is the worst. And uh, he was unbelievable. And uh, I really think that uh, I was the first chair chairman of, of 
and I'm only 50 years now, and 45 years ago. The picture yeah, showed me how young yeah, you were. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and how long have you been there? I just uh, finished my 26th year. Yeah, I know you've been there for a long time, and I, uh, I can't say enough about Dr. Dobbin, and he dedicates his life to uh, this in heart in this community and the whole region and he uh, all kind uh, other other people um, um, have tried to do the same thing so anyway I I just congratulate you and uh, I I also um, was running uh, with uh, Stafford all of, with uh, the Niagara running group mm -hmm. so and and he was here uh, I think less than a year ago and and he has passed away very sad mm -hmm. but congratulations on all you do and uh, as long as I'm here, the city will fully uh, support you with this great um, effort for the community. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And yes, Councillor Strange. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and uh, a little bit of echo on, on uh, Councillor Thompson's comments, but thank you for the presentation. And been here for, for, for so long and um, you know, you realize Niagara Falls, how uh, we have a major aging population and a lot of health. You just did a 102nd birthday. Yeah. So, you know, it's stories like that because of your programs and stuff like that and how important to stay healthy, especially with your heart. And it goes from young to older people. You watch young kids now and, and you know, 20 years ago, how, many, how much of our population used to smoke? It was incredible. And now because of programs like you and how smoking is such a... Uh, uh, has a horrible effect on, on the heart and, and your arteries and because of getting that message across you see kids now and, and very rarely we ever see a kid smoking but it's because of programs like you and and uh, we have a an elder uh, population because they are healthier now because of programs like yourself so thank you very much for the Great. Great. Thanks. presentation today. thank you counselor okay so i'm looking for a motion to receive the presentation from oh, martin Niagara. yes I, yep. absolutely okay yeah. motion by councillor uh, thompson second by councillor lococo if there's no further discussion all those in favor okay and that's unanimous thanks thank very you. much karen thank you okay now and i think uh, our cao we need to let our cao know that we are um, about to uh, start this part of the presentation i don't know if anybody can uh, get okay kira oh thank you right up there, that's good. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. So next up is item 6.3, for those of you following along on the agenda, 2023 boards and commissions, fee for service, grants and honorariums and recommendations. So there's a, a group, uh, we've got a number of groups that'll be presenting right now. So first up is Women's Place of South Niagara, and we've got Jennifer Gauthier, Executive Director. So welcome. Good evening, Mayor Diodotti and council members. Thank you for having me. Sorry, I'm just gonna flip this up. So thank you for allowing me to present about Women's Place of South Ni Niagara today and share a little bit about what we do for the community and how your support uh, really shapes the safety of women and children here in Niagara. I was happy to connect with many of you in advance of the recent election and thank you all for your ongoing support and some of the work that you have done to support our organization and to help make Niagara safer. There we go. 
So Women's Place provides safe shelter, and that's what you probably notice, know us for here in Niagara. So we have 40 safe shelter beds, but we also provide many other services. We have a 24-7 crisis line that you can call or text. We have a adult and child and youth counseling. We have group counseling for women. We provide public education and prevention with a focus on ending gender-based stereotypes that perpetuate the mistreatment of women and girls. And we have numerous outreach support, such as housing, legal, a new program where we provide aftercare to people after they discharge the shelter. So we're going into their homes and helping them be successful when they transition so they're not wanting to return to their abuser. So we are very proud that in the summer of 2022, we were able to open our newly expanded facility right here in Niagara Falls. So we increased our capacity by 33%, adding 10 additional beds, uh, which since our doors have opened, have been full. So I would like to show a brief shelter tour. I'm not even sure if I'm able to click that link. Yes. For those of you that weren't able to see the, come to the event. So this is our front door. We're located on McLeod Road. We used to be a confidential address. We're not anymore. Um, this is where women would access their safe rooms. And so it was really important to us that each room looked like a home. And so that women felt comfortable when they accessed and they didn't feel like it was a strange place. So we are really to excited to have the support of many community organizations that help sponsor rooms. And so they turned out really well. We have many group gathering spaces where people can have some camaraderie and make new friends. This is our new dining room area. We do have a food service worker that provides uh, safe or healthy meals for women and children five nights a week. And we have uh, numerous kitchen space so that they can cook any meals they want themselves. People find that quite con comforting. More kitchen video. <laughs> All food is free when you're in the shelter, and so we provide everything that they need, basic needs, so clothing, food, anything. This is a group uh, living room. We celebrate many holidays here. Laundry is free. We have facilities on property, uh, so they can access that. This is our, our playroom, and so we have a lovely space for children to play. This is a teen lounge area. We have all kinds of video games so they can have their own space, and an arts and crafts room as well for young kids where we run a lot of programming. We have many outdoor spaces. This one's not quite complete yet, where women can barbecue and make food, lots of outdoor play and safe furniture, and we have a playground that's being installed right now. So how your support helps. We're really excited to be able to rely on the community to support our organization and the city of Niagara Falls. So last fiscal year, we were able to provide safe shelter to 138 women and 87 children. And we were there to answer the phone 2,911 times when women called in crisis and needed our help. We provided 102 counseling, uh, counseling to sorry, unique women 208 women were able to gain access to safe and affordable housing. So this is so important and such a barrier for women leaving abusive relationships. And 205 women received legal support. And our new public education program had 46 presentations to 982 people, which is really working towards our mission of preventing future violence. Now more than ever, supporting women and children is extremely important. Every year during the pandemic, we saw the numbers, the femicide numbers rise. And so femicide is when a woman or girl is murdered by their partner or parent or just for being a girl. Last year in Ontario alone, 58 girls were murdered. That's significant. So now more than ever, we need consistent funding to, sit, to keep women and children safe. Your impact. So... We've been really lucky to rely on the city of Niagara Falls and their support of $19,500 annually for many, many years. The loss of any funding jeopardizes the number of people that we can support. 
The 10 additional beds that were added to our facility were done so without any additional funding as we strive to meet the needs of the women and children in Niagara and keep them safe. If we are not able to rely on funding, we will have to turn to fundraising. And this of course is not a guarantee, especially given the fiscal impacts across the community that we're all seeing of inflation. And so the result of us having, of losing funding would be closing beds. A safe night in our shelter costs $247 for a family, and that's all of the supports and everything they need. And so for a very small portion of the city's operational budget makes a huge impact in that the city provides 80 safe nights for women and children to be free from abuse. So the loss of funding could result in the closure of those beds. What that means is that we're going to be turning women and children away, leaving them at risk of future abuse. An application-based system would be very difficult for us. Having consistent operational funding is something that we can plan for the future. We rely on that funding and we plan around it year by year in order to make sure that we can continue to provide safe beds. We hope we can continue to rely on the city of Niagara Falls. So again, thank you for taking the time to learn about Women's Place and for hearing about us tonight. I hope you consider the impact to a, a, a cut in our operational funding or a, a non-committed funding would look like for us. Uh, more information about Women's Place can always be found on our website, uh, www.womensplacesn.org. And if you or someone you know is abused, please reach out to our 24-7 crisis line so we can help keep them safe. I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you again for your time. Thanks very much, Jennifer. We've got uh, Councillor Newestag. Uh, through you, um, Your Honor, Mr. Mayor, um, what is the average length of stay for uh, someone come, is seeking help through you? Sure, it really depends on the need of the individual, and so we offer person-centered services, so we do not have a timeline on shelter stay. We want to make sure that when women leave an abusive partner, that they're able to do so successfully, and so they can stay with us until that they have someplace safe to go. So they can stay with us sometimes for 30 days, sometimes for 90 days. We've had individuals that have very unique needs, such as brain injuries, stay with us for over a year as we work to set up services so they can transition successfully uh, into the community. So it's really based on the needs of the, of the individual. Have you ever had to turn anyone away? We have, and so that's why we've had to expand. And so we rely on our community partners, like the Y, um, which will provide safe homeless shelter beds to women, but they don't have the same safety features that we have uh, or, the, or the counseling specific to abuse that we're able to provide. So you see them through, if you can't accommodate, you make sure you're able to pass. Um... Absolutely, and so we'll work with them, provide safety planning, work with them on an outreach basis. You don't have to stay in shelter to access our services. You can access our services and, and live in the community as well. Okay, very good, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, yes, Councillor Strange. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Martin, and thank you, Jennifer, for thank the uh, presentation. And um, for a lot of the public who don't know about Women's Place, what is the process? Like, so how many rooms do you have right now? I know you, you uh, added 10. We have 40. You have 40 rooms. Um, so what is the process? Do, do you get a call from a, a, a person in, in like a beat domestic abuse, or do you get, a, do you get someone that, uh, um, you know, nine, nine, 11 or, or what, what happens like as far as like do you get a call from different places sure we work, work with a lot of community partners people can call us directly uh, over our crisis line and they can get access to our shelter service there but we also have partnerships with the Niagara Regional Police and paramedics hospital doctors so that when people need support they know who to reach out to and then we can facilitate that so we work closely with uh, the Bax Niagara as well, um, so a lot of families coming into us. Okay, and then if a, a woman and their and their child or children have to stay there, does it cost them anything at all? It does not cost them anything at all. Women and children often come to us with nothing, maybe the clothes on their back. And so when they come, we make sure that they get new clothing, that they have everything they need to be successful. We will help them secure furniture, housing items, set up all of their utilities and things like that and then really work with them so that they can you know live a life free from abuse okay 
Okay, and then for, I know we fund a bit every year, and where else does your funding come from? How, how do you, how do you? So we're largely funded by the Ministry of Children and Community Social Services. So they provide um, a good chunk of our operational core funding, but we also um, have other municipal grants that we rely on funding through United Way, mm -hmm. Branscombe Family Foundation, and the community is quite generous in their donations as well. You know, when you, when you think about that, I work with Ron McDonald House quite a bit for children, but it's almost like a, it's almost like the same type of, of uh, atmosphere, like the, with 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 women and, and children going on. So I think it's such an important service that we have here. And thank thank you for for everything that you guys do and and hooking up with the with the Y as well. When you can share facilities like that, it's so important. So thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, Councillor Patel. Hello. Hello. Do you have brochures in the doctor's offices or community centers where people can access the information? Yes, at some facilities, especially community health centers, and we actually operate satellite uh, offices out of a few community health centers so that women uh, that are accessing those facilities in Welland and Fort Erie and Port Colborn can easily access information. Our public education person is working to create those relationships and get those information out. And thank you, Mona, for recently hosting an event for us. We really appreciate it. Uh, when I hosted the barbecue, that's when we actually had two women who came and took the information from Keegan because they weren't aware of the service like this in Niagara Falls. So if we can do a better job of getting information out there, maybe even high schools, because there are lots of kids who are stuck in the houses like that where there is an abusive spouse in the house and then mother and kids are going through the same situation. Mm -hmm. And we are very excited to get uh, funding from a generous family, the Slate family, that has funded our public education program uh, for the next 10 years. So we'll be working to get into schools and do a lot of that prevention work so that people know about us or they don't end up in an abusive relationship or become an abuser in the first place. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Thank you for that. And I know I was joined by Councillor Lococo when we toured uh, the opening of the expansion and very impressive. <coughs> You know, you've done a really, really good job making it open and comfortable and yet cozy at the same time. So they've done a really great job. So if there's no further questions, I'm looking for a motion to receive the presentation from Jennifer, moved by Councillor Campbell, seconded by Councillor Newestag. All those in favor? Okay, and that's unanimous. Thanks very Thank much, you. Jennifer. Thank you. Okay, next up is the YWCA. We've got Elizabeth Zimmerman. Hi, uh, good evening. Thank you, Mayor, Councillors, for the opportunity to come and speak tonight. I have a short presentation as well, and uh, I think you'll see common themes in terms of how we're uh, the impact that your grants have had on our organizations and the services that we are able to provide. Um, so, we are the YWCA Niagara Region, and I did see it there for a second. <laughs> And we have um, been providing service in the community since 1927. Am I forward? How do I forward? So the, oh, okay, there we go. Okay, there we go, thank you. So our mission is to be the change agent for community transformation, ending gender inequity and social injustice. And we do that through our housing programs, girls programs, and I'll speak to each. And our vision is an equitable society where women and families thrive. Um, to begin the presentation, I do want to just mention there are lots of municipalities throughout Ontario that do provide uh, similar grants uh, to YWCA's uh, homeless shelters in Toronto, Hamilton, and Kitchener. Um, we are part of a national um, federation. There are about 32 member associations across Canada. We are the largest provider in Canada as YWCAs of homeless shelters as well as domestic violence shelters. And um, so we are, you know, have very strong relationships with many municipalities as we've had with, with the city of Niagara Falls. Um, we have skills development programs. Uh, these are uh, we. These are the programs that we offer in uh, the city of Niagara Falls. Um, 
in addition to the shelter, which you helped to fund. So the shelter has become, in a sense, a hub for providing all kinds of other services that um, are funded through various means. Um, so this is some of those programs that we offer. Uh, we have been um, able to do uh, the Women's Addiction Recovery Mediation was uh, actually an organization that stood on its own and uh, provided services in Niagara Falls, but small organizations struggle. And so we wanted to make sure that the program kept going, kept running, and we worked with the organization to ensure that uh, we could continue to operate those programs. And we now operate them in um, across the region. Um, sex Trade on My Terms is a program for women who are engaged in survival sex work. It is through that program, which we operated in St. Catharines and now operate in Niagara Falls, that we determined that over 80% of the women who were um, engaged in survival sex work were actually had been victims of human trafficking and spurred us to do more work in uh, anti-human trafficking. And uh, we have a emergency <laughs> protocol uh, where we work with a number of agencies as well as um, like uh, police services and other uh, services to provide um, uh, crisis support for women and also through that then received provincial funding to um, do a residential program for women who've been victims of human trafficking. And then with our participants in our shelters and our other programs, we do also additional life skills programs. We do in-school programming in uh, Niagara, uh, throughout Niagara uh, in, in schools. Uh, a lot of this is really prevention. It's girls-focused programs to uh, build resilience in girls, to educate. Uh, we use that as opportunities to educate around grooming um, and, uh, and healthy relationships and all kinds of other things. Um, so in terms of our shelter, the uh, in this past year, we served 115 women and gender diverse folks, uh, 22 youth and children, and seven seniors. So in there, um, in our shelter, so this is pr uh, supporting women and women with children who are experiencing homelessness, and uh, uh, people experience homelessness for a number of different reasons. Um, so this is uh, the primary funding that you provide is to ensure that the shelter is, is uh, there. And you can see here in this diagram that 10% of our funding comes through you. Um, I know that uh, the, you know, the majority of our funding does come through the region through homelessness services, uh, through homelessness services which is funding that is filtered through both federally and provincially. But you can see here that it actually only provides 64% of the funding that we need to operate. Our annual budget to operate this shelter is 530,000. So the $51,000 grant that we receive becomes a really important grant to ensure that we're able to provide the level of service that we do. It's a 24 hour operation. We have 20 beds and uh, as well as six transitional beds in our facility at Culp Street. And um, we would be in the same position as Women's Place that if we lose this funding, we are already doing a lot of fundraising to try to ensure that we're meeting the goals of, um, of the uh, cost of operating this program, um, that it would put additional pressure and we would have to really start to look at whether we would be able to provide the level of service that we can, that we are currently. Oh, I keep using the wrong. So I wanted to also just give you a little bit of history as to uh, this grant. Um, the building on Culp Street where you see the picture was actually YWCA Niagara Falls. And in about 2004, I'm not quite sure on the exact date, they closed down uh, that facility. In uh, 2005, 2004, 2005, YWCA St. Catharines was approached by the city of Niagara Falls, United Way Niagara Falls, and the region of Niagara to reopen it as a women's shelter. We had match grants from the city of Niagara Falls and United Way, as well as per diem funding from the region to be able to start to operate that um, facility. So it really was a joint project at the bequest of the city of Niagara Falls to ensure that women who were experience, and children who were experiencing homelessness would have some place to stay in Niagara Falls. So the United Way has continued to fund us. They actually, their grant has grown. The city of Niagara Falls funding has been stagnant since 2011. 
Um, we have in that used the opportunity to expand programming through additional funding uh, for other programs as I indicated and uh, we are we are able then to provide further services. We are also now operating um, a modified men and family shelter, um, actually a, a hotel in, or a motel in Niagara Falls. We've been operating that for probably about 10 years now. So the, uh, and that came out of actually a, um, a mayor's committee on ho um, housing and homelessness um, and the identification there was a need for men's sheltering as well because we were already providing the services for women and children. Um, so we were able to, at, uh, at the, um, with the board, to make the decision to continue uh, to provide men, uh, men's sheltering as well as seeing the need to provide more shelters for uh, families, so two-parent families or male-led uh, single-parent families. Um, and the reality is, as you are all aware, the how there is a housing crisis in Niagara, and we have uh, seen a consistent increase in the number of people accessing shelter. Uh, prior, when we first started this grant, we were sitting at, on average, around 50% occupancy. We now are over constantly 100% occupancy. We've also added um, on-site transitional beds, so we are able to uh, support women who have a lot of barriers to independent housing and um, we support them with 24-hour services because of the shelter uh, and uh, at uh, in Culp Street so um, these are the numbers of uh, children uh, I'm sorry adults and children who have um, benefited from that on-site program we also have uh, 15, I think it's 15 units of housing that we had lease, which provides additional transitional housing. This is um, in Niagara Falls. We have uh, up to 65 units across the region. These are the numbers for the whole region, but in Niagara Falls, we have about 15 units that provide a longer term program for women and, and uh, their children um, up to three years, which really uh, supports that uh, transition from homelessness, or we work very closely with our community partner, Women's Place. Uh, it could be providing second stage housing for, housing for women who have, are fleeing violence um, and to be able to give them additional supports to uh, move to a point of self-sufficiency. And then we have two additional family units uh, that are um, apartments that we have lease that uh, support uh, families in a more, uh, we try to normalize uh, life for, for families, particularly families with children. It's a very traumatic um, event to go through homelessness. And uh, so by providing them with an apartment-like atmosphere with supports, we're able to um, connect them to resources and help them to restabilize to be able to find permanent housing. So just our men and family shelter, which I mentioned in the past year, we supported 57 men, 27 children, six youth, and 30 women. And I think too often we forget that it is children who are also experiencing homelessness. And so to have really safe places where women and children can um, have stability, have connection to resources and supports, um, it helps to stabilize that family and reduce the trauma of the homelessness experience that they're having. Uh, in terms of the, the turnaways, because ultimately we still are not meeting the need, uh, you can see here our numbers for um, the region, uh, as well as the men's shelter. And in terms of our offsite housing, which is the scattered uh, transitional housing, uh, we have constant wait lists in um, terms of uh, people who are waiting also for our onsite in Niagara Falls, we also have wait lists. So the impact of this particular grant that we receive, and although I understand the rationale that um, has been put forward around transparency and uh, a transparent process, um, these this it has been a historical grant that has ensured that we are able to provide this kind of service in the city of Niagara Falls and was started at the request of the city of Niagara Falls. So I think that's about it. Thank you so much. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thanks, Elizabeth. I've got uh, Councillor Newstake. 
for you, Mr. Mayor. Um, these 295 individuals that were turned away, so what I'm understanding is women place their fall, they come to you, then where do they go from you? So if it's a family, we work with the region and they will be placed, you know, uh, most likely they'll be placed in what they call an overflow shelter, but that is uh, basically a hotel room without any kind of supports. And the support piece is really important, particularly around uh, helping people to connect to community and um, resources to be able to help them find stay housing so we want to make sure that nobody is on the street uh, but as much as possible so as much as possible we're working either with other community partners or with the region to see that people are housed in for emergency but they always have a place to be to hopefully yes okay. and you said that um, there's many people on the wait list for transitional housing where are they waiting again in these hotel rooms? They or? could be waiting in a uh, shelter. They could be waiting um, in precarious kinds of housing situations. There's lots of different reasons why, where there are lots of different ways they could be <coughs> waiting. I think particularly for women, uh, you know, we often don't see women uh, as uh, often in street entrenched homelessness. Um, they're more likely to be either in very precarious housing situations um, and what we call hidden homelessness. So then we're supporting them as much as we can through that period of time until we can bring them into, um, into one of our, our uh, units or into shelter. Thank you. Okay. Time for me. Thank you. Any other questions of council? <coughs> Councillor Patel. Through you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, when the women come with the children, do these children attend the school regularly? Yes, yes they do. Uh, we do what we can to, if it's possible, we'll keep them in their home school, but otherwise we'll work with the local schools to ensure that they are continuing in their school. So just to, we do have a family shelter in uh, St. Catharines. Uh, we were actually having challenges because the kids were recognized as being in shelter and experiencing bullying. Um, so we were able to work with the school board to ensure they had their own transportation to get to school. But we do make sure that kids get to school. We make sure they have a lunch, that they're, you know, that they have um, what they need to be successful. Thank you. And when you support, does the support include like counseling and are you supporting women to find a new employment, finding a job? Yeah, I think we, again, are very much person-centered. We're meeting women where they're at and what their needs are. Um, we don't do specific counseling. What we do is we provide supports to connect to community resources um, or to help uh, to set goals. So any of our transitional housing programs are very goal-centered um, to help them to move to a place of stability. So employment is part of that, can be part of that, um, but it can be also connecting with um, mental health support supports, substance use supports, it can be connecting to some kind of income supports. We have women who come in who don't have any kind of income. Um, so it's really, you know, understanding what their needs are in that moment and how we support them to move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. If there's no further questions, look for a motion to receive the presentation. Councillor Thompson, seconded by Councillor Baldinelli. There's no further discussion. I'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that's unanimous. Thanks very much, Liz. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so you. much for the opportunity. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Kim. We're going to switch Kim here with our CAO's seat. Open his seat up here now. Okay, next up, and I apologize. I got the order out of whack here, so I apologize for everyone waiting here. Project Share. We've got Pam Sharp, Executive Director, and I see a lot of the board members here. So welcome to the Project Share team. Good evening. Uh, thank you, uh, Mayor Diodati and Council, for the opportunity to present to you this evening and to share a little bit about our organization and the impact on the funding, the impact your funding has. I'd like to acknowledge, as uh, Mayor Diodati said, I have several board members, some of our volunteers and staff members uh, here with me this evening. So, I'd like to acknowledge them. Uh, the, just to give you a bit of history on how Project Share was created, uh, so back in 1983, uh, we were known as Coordinated Outreach Emergency Services, which was created as a short-term response to hunger in Niagara Falls under the leadership of Councillor Thompson. The initial location was in the basement of City Hall, starting a long-standing partnership with the City of Niagara Falls. In 1989, it became Project Share, and our services increased to meet the growing needs in our community. In 1992, it was evident that this temporary response would be needed long-term, and we became incorporated. 
More than 30 years later, Project Share is now an essential service, providing over 15 programs to help keep our neighbours fed, housed and healthy. Emergency food is the immediate need that brings people in the door and from there they are connected to all applicable support services through a one-on-one -on -one meeting with a trained client services worker. You heard the term person-centered service by my fellow uh, service providers that prevented before me and that is what we firmly believe at Project Share as well. Every story is different, every need is different to what brings a family through our doors and from that initial conversation we can uncover those needs and connect them with all of the services both at our agency <coughs> and out in the communities. Clients can choose their own food items with dignity and fresh produce is our most requested food item through our food bank. Delivery service is offered to those who need it due to physical or mental health conditions and nobody is ever turned away. So that brings us to our current state right now. In the calendar year of 2022, 9,313 individuals accessed our emergency support services. That represents one in every 10 residents of our city. 35% of those we helped are children and youth, and emergency services were provided over 55,000 times. Over 928,000 pounds of emergency food was distributed, which is a value of almost $3 million. The impact of your annual funding is the only source of our core reliable funding for our emergency food program. While we are a multi-service agency, I've catered most of this presentation to our emergency food program because that's where your dollars are designated. No other government funding is received for this program and this represents 17% of, of our monetary budget. On top of that, our local fundraising budget is more than double the amount from the city from, for $790,000 in monetary gifts on top of the $2.6 million we need to raise from in-kind donations of food and toys and clothing for our Christmas program. So while we rely on the city's support every year financially, we certainly don't just rely on that. We're working very hard to make sure we can meet the needs in our community. We view our funding from the city as a partnership. We know that Food Bank is not the solution to solving food insecurity and we are committed to working with other service providers to best meet the needs in our community while advocating for long-term supports. We receive many referrals for our services through the mayor's office and through city staff and we've been told by our clients that if they could not access our emergency support programs, they might starve or they might end up behind bars. So these are some pretty severe consequences if our essential services were not offered to the community. We were previously funded by the city as a fee-for-service agency prior to becoming a grant because we have been seen as an essential service to residents of Niagara Falls. We currently receive 75% of the proposed budget for social health and funding grants as Council decided many years ago to focus their funding on essential services that help our residents meet their basic needs. This brings some concerns uh, when we are talking about a process that is not necessarily a commitment to annual funding for Project Share and the services that we provide. Because the need for our services is growing exponentially. Just last month, we saw an 85% increase in our units of service over the same month last year. The cost to the city should our services be reduced or not available would be significantly greater. Hamilton Food Share, which is a food bank partner that we're both members of Feed Ontario and Food Banks Canada, recently did a study with McMaster University in the fall, which reported that almost half of food bank users stated that they would suffer some homelessness without access to their food bank. We are in a crisis. This council declared a state of emergency back in June on mental health, homelessness and addiction. The information I just shared with you that's come out of that McMaster report states that that crisis is going to get a lot worse if emergency services are not available to the residents of our city. So you've heard from uh, the pre previous two presenters, uh, some of my uh, colleagues, that the concern for us in, in this new proposed strategy is the commitment. So if we move to an independent review committee, can we continue to rely on that core funding and what would the consequences to our programs be if we cannot rely on that core funding? 
So we've been seen as a city responsibility ever since our inception more than 30 years ago. It is my ask to you tonight that Council continue to identify our essential services as a city priority in alignment with your strategic priorities that many of you expressed when you recently ran for Council beyond 2024. So we appreciate and thank you for your support uh, that has been proposed for the next two years, but I'm hoping that you will continue to see that as a city responsibility while the need is there. I really hope one day I can stand in front of you and say our numbers are going down and we're not needed anymore. Uh, but until that time, I'd like to ask council to make sure that we are here for our residents who need us. Thank so you. thank you very much. I'll thank take any questions. Thanks very much, Pam. So I've got Councillor Thompson, then I've got Councillor Coco. Thank you, Pam. Um, um, this building was built in 1970, opened, and the basement was completely clear. There was nothing there, construction at all. And um, I heard about what was going around in the community with people having difficulty and I really uh, spent 28 years with the health department and I was uh, running into people with really serious uh, problem with food and looking after their children so I started, it wasn't Project Share, it was COS, and I have to stand up this morning, or this, this evening, to talk about two people, Nancy Reynolds and uh, Diane um, Shepard, uh, who were, um, totally dedicated to uh, doing, helping people in, in the community. And they helped me so much uh, back then. And uh, in a few years, uh, it became a Project Share. And it's one of the most uh, long with uh, all the other ones we heard uh, tonight. Uh, what a great community uh, to hear all this about what's happening in Niagara Falls for the residents. Anyway, congratulations, and uh, we will support you all the time. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Coco. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, through the mayor to the speaker. Thank you so much, Pam, for the presentation. Um, I do have a couple of questions for you. It's been said that most municipalities do not fund food banks. I was wondering um, if you could share any information uh, regionally for us on that. Yes, absolutely, thank you. So uh, we, it's Niagara Falls funds Project Share, of course, and the city of Welland also funds both Open Arms Mission and the Hope Center. Okay, thank you. If the city doesn't fund Project Share, will the region step up? No, so I've had conversations with the region and their funding that we receive is specific to our homelessness prevention program, which falls under a region responsibility. Uh, they have shared with me they will not fund our emergency food program. That's not in their area of funding. So if the city funding is not received for our emergency food program, the region is not prepared to replace that. Okay, thank you. I know this is a difficult time in the economy right now. All organizations are trying to go after the same pot of money. There is some correspondence on our agenda today from GROW, and it talks about some, some statistics specifically for Project Share, and I was wondering if you could expand on those, those statistics for us. Yeah, absolutely. So it's stated in that communication that we distribute non-perishable food only, um, which when in fact the most requested item from our food bank is fresh 
perishable produce. So we have three community garden sites located within the city where we grow a lot of our own and lots of partnerships with farmers and local grocery stores to make sure that we have access to those fresh and healthy foods for our clients as well. Um, it's also stated that uh, we ask for uh, criteria when somebody comes to Project Share. Um, this is known as means testing. That's not something that we do at Project Share anymore. Uh, as a member of Feed Ontario, we commit to their standards of care and their best practices, and that is to reduce as many barriers as possible for people to access our emergency services. So we do not ask for any proof of income when somebody comes into Project Share. They can come in more than once a month. Well, we do suggest that our emergency food program is a monthly visit, we don't turn anybody away. So if they're coming in more than once a month, they are going to get support from us, as well as be connected to the other uh, services that are available for food within the city. Uh, I recently took the lead on compiling a list of resources that we could give out to our clients, which I've shared with the mayor's office, um, so that people know what other services are available for them. Um, and there is a stat stating that only 25% of people who are experiencing food insecurity are accessing our programs. Well, I don't know where that statistic necessarily came from. I, I can't speak for the writer. Um, the current data that we have from Niagara Region on food insecurity, which is back from 2019, so I know that uh, you know population has changed a little bit then, um, compared to our current numbers, shows that we are serving 86% of the population that is food insecure here in Niagara Falls. Okay, thank you. I have found over the years there's many different silos of organizations. Some are overlapping services, some we have gaps in between, and I'm wondering if you've had conversations of collaboration or pooling resources together. Absolutely. So just yesterday I met with um, The Bridge, who uh, operates Third Space Cafe, which is the breakfast program here in Niagara Falls, uh, to talk about ways that we can work together to share food resources and support their program. I've had similar conversations with The Soup Kitchen. I firmly believe that we are stronger together and collaboration is the only way for us to meet this growing need because we can't do it alone. We know that we are not the solution to food insecurity, so we need to bring everybody together to meet this growing problem. Um, we are a member of Feed Ontario and Food Banks Canada, and out of that membership, we have formed a new partnership known as Feed Niagara, and we're working very closely with the food banks that are serving other municipalities to share best practices, to share surplus of food, when we have when we have it to avoid food going bad instead of going to mouths that really need it and just really working collectively to stretch donor dollars and do bulk purchasing and really have the biggest impact we possibly can thank you I've had the pleasure of sitting on the Project Share Board for many years, and it always amazed me the um, level of dignity that Project Share employees um, pass on to the clients, and they, they're not made to feel that it's a bad thing to be there. They're given many resources. A lot of times we just think Project Share is a food bank. They give so many other resources. There's homelessness, there's housing, there's um, hydro cutoff, there's dental, there's all of these different programs, um, how to cook. So it's not just a food bank, it, it's a sort of a one-stop shop, but there's so many other different organizations in our community that can complement what Project Share is doing. So thank you so much for coming and, and speaking to us tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Strange. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, Pam, for the presentation. For the, for the general public who, who don't realize how Project Share works, what is the process if, if somebody uh, can't afford food? How do, how do they go about getting food from you? Like, do you, do you look at uh, um, their income? How does that work? In order to access our food program, all we need to know is that they're a resident of Niagara Falls. And, and, and if they show up on our door and they are not a resident of Niagara Falls, we're still going to give them food that day and connect them with the food bank in their community. So we make sure we're not turning anyone away without support. Uh, the process when they come in the door is that they're going to meet one-on-one -on -one with a trained client services staff member. Our goal is that they are going to be connected to all of our internal services. So Project Share has 15 programs and services that support basic needs um, as well as external referrals so our goal is that they're only going to have to tell their story once and be connected to all of the community support so they're going to help them and their family meet their basic needs okay. thank you you're welcome thank you for that
Are there any other questions? Okay, looks like we've got all the questions answered. Okay, uh, I do you. have one question. Now, the comments from um, Grow that you don't serve uh, <coughs> perishables, and I know that as well. Uh, has anybody reached out to them just to correct the record to let them know? I do plan to. Oh. Um, I haven't yet. I just recently received uh, this uh, information through the, the council agenda, but I do plan to reach out. Um, when they first came to Niagara Falls, we did reach out and invited them to come and have a meeting and talk about how we can collaborate and work together. Um, I have since toured their facility, but um, I think there's certainly an opportunity for a stronger uh, collaboration and partnership and working together to better serve our, our residents. Absolutely, that's great. Yes, Councillor Coco. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I've been trying to connect with Pam from Grow. We've been missing each other through email, so I haven't had an opportunity to speak with her. But when they did come into Niagara Falls, I did meet with them. I toured the facility, understand what they were doing, and I actually connected with Pam. Uh, this Pam, Pam from Project Share, they have a granting um, software program that gives them a list of all of the grants and Pam was more than, more than happy to share that information with Pam from Grow if they wanted to apply any grants. So there was some communication between Project Share and Grow earlier and I've offered to work with Grow to whatever I could help with, with there as well. That's great. Okay, good, excellent. So I'm looking for a motion to, res oh, did you wanna speak? I'm sorry, Councillor Patel. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I actually have pleasure of volunteering at the project share once a week, and I see the operation from inside, and lots of people who volunteer at the project share are the previous user of the food bank. So people who are helped by project share, they actually do come back and give back to community. And with the, my understanding, there used to be a program twice a month, and now there's a once a month, right? That's what it is now. Yes, yeah, so we're struggling to meet the need right now. I mean, we're serving, you know, an average of 125 families every single day to the point where, you know, we had uh, the, the fire department come in and give us our capacity recently because our waiting room has been so full that we've had people outside. So our goal was initially we used to have a bonus shop and a monthly shop, so twice a month. Our goal is to give the same amount of support in one visit. So there were certain items people received, household products, things, toiletries, um, condiments, things like that. On on their bonus shop which they now receive on their monthly visit the goal is the same amount of support in one visit as opposed to two just to help us meet this growing need in our community however again we never turn anyone away so we do still have some clients that need to come more than once a month and we do welcome them and, and support them I'm glad that we're continuing this grant for next two years because times like this especially cost of living is up so high people are struggling to make ends meet these charities are needed more than ever and in a perfect world, we would not need a women's shelter, YWCA, or project share. Mm -hmm. It's sad that in 2022, we need organizations like a uh, woman's place. Well, hopefully one day we can close doors in a woman's place and we'll all live in perfect world. You're good. Thank you. Thank you for that. I've got Councillor Campbell, then Lakoko again. Thank you, Your Worship. I uh, had the opportunity to sit on the board for several years, and I have to tell you, uh, I look at all these people that participate and uh, they're diehards. And I don't know what we would do in our community without Project Share. I wanna thank you ever so much. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, Councilor Lacoco. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. One thing I forgot to mention, there's also a stress on Project Share and a lot of our services in the community right now because we have a lot of asylum seekers and some refugees in our community. So um, it is putting extra pressure on on our resources and I, I know through Project Share they're trying to work with it so um, there's been discussions with our federal MP about how um, how to work around that you know we, we want to help and serve the refugees and the asylum seekers but in order to do that we need resources and funding as well you're Thank exactly you. right and transportation to get them there and a lot of our motels are filled up with some of these people you're exactly right so uh, thank you for a lot of great questions, a lot of great information. Thank you to the board and all the volunteers for taking time out of your busy schedules to be here to join us tonight. So I'm looking for a motion tonight to receive the presentation. I've got Councillor Thompson, seconded by Councillor Lococo. If there's no further discussion, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? And that is approved unanimously. So thank you very much. Appreciate you thank coming Thank you out. so much. Thank you.
Council, just before we uh, sorry, yes, just before we move on to planning, the clerk reminds me. I'm a little forgetful today. Um, I need my ginkgo biloba, I think, right, just to keep me a little sharper. Uh, there are uh, there is a report, and there are six recommendations there. If you'll have a look at that, F twenty twenty three o two, and six rec recommendations. I've got Councillor Peter Angelo, then the Coco. Yeah, thanks, Your Worship. Um, just a couple questions, Your Worship. I mean, uh, I didn't realize everyone was going to leave the room, but you know, I think some of the organizations that spoke to us, like. Uh, Project Share, uh, Women's Place, YW, I know Pastones was supposed to be here. Those organizations have been around for years. They seem like, you know, the foundation of our city. Um, you know, and then, I mean, it seems that we're, you know, being pulled in a different argument of direction, and that is that, you know, there's a, a number of other good nonprofit organizations out there, and I know we see a lot of them that comes uh, through Sleep Cheap. We get probably somewhere you know, between 30 and 40 different applications a year. It always, um, it always amazes me when I read some of them that, that we have some of these great nonprofits in our city who are saying that we have, a very, we have a very closed system here in the city of Niagara Falls in the sense that, you know, you've chosen to fund a few organizations and you're not funding any of the others. I, I, and I can understand that argument. And then the third argument that I think is on the table really is just in regards to uh, staff continually tell us that you know, the grants or the donations do not actually align with our core responsibilities, which is infrastructure, parks, things of that nature. So it is a difficult decision. Um, I have some questions in regards to, uh, I guess, the committee that is looking at being set up. And I guess I'll pass it through uh, through you to either our CAO or Ms. Clark. Um, so in the report right now, we're being asked to um, I guess send the decision of <coughs> grants or donations over to a committee uh, and that would start within two years time. Do I have that right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Mr. Uh, through the Through the mayor to the councillor, uh, really the ask is to come back with a system and council can decide whether the decision rests solely with the committee, whether there is input to it. Uh, I think the best practice is that the <coughs> council sets the strategy and the funding pools and what they're willing to fund, which issues they're willing to fund, and have the individual donation or granting be done by an independent committee, but that would be up to uh, council's uh, final decision. We're just, we're essentially asking to come back with a, uh, an improved process for for the allocation of these grants okay and I guess based on the report the report is asking us to put two hundred and fifty thousand dollars from OLG into reserves and this would be to I guess give to the committee to uh, gift to different nonprofits and then on top of that 250 uh, the city is planning on keeping a hundred and fifty thousand dollars in our operating budget so that would total four hundred thousand dollars which in a sense, I guess, equals the four organizations that were listed on our, uh, on our agenda tonight. Would that be fair to say? Yeah, that would be correct. Yeah, so we're, and in the report to staff would prefer, staff believe for it to be effective funding. Um, you know, I think we're not doing the agencies or what we want to do here um, any justice by holding or freezing, uh, you know, their fees. We, in the report, we talk about moving to kind of a, uh, uh, an inflation indexed fund uh, because for, you know, the YWCA to receive the same amount of money for 11 years makes zero sense. It's, it becomes, um, you know, less and less effective. Uh, if it is a priority for council, um, to fund an agency, there should be some uh, indication to, you know, increasing levels of funding for that pool to, to address the, those issues, or at least having types to reset it to, you know, to allow council to invest either more or less money in a particular issue uh, going forward. So that would be part of the recommendations going forward, is that, you know, I think council needs to be able to, you know, this council here decided to put a, uh, a state of emergency on one of the items in the state of emergency is addiction you know 
none of our funding really addresses purely addiction issues. Uh, but if it, if it is a priority of council, there should be mechanisms in place so that council can move funds or increase funds to solve issues that are, you know, that this council deems to be important uh, there. So we, we'd like to put mechanisms in place to, to be able to flex that funding appropriately for the agencies and to solve the problems that this council deems important. Okay. Um, so just to stick with one theme at one time, um, if we're looking at we uh, grant or, or donate about $400,000 to these organizations, but now we're going to say, okay, we're going to put that $400,000 with a committee and we're going to open it up to more applications. Um, then I guess conceivably there's going to be more nonprofits that are going to receive the same pool of money. So I guess we can understand why, you know, some of them are getting anxious in the sense that, you know, we, uh, we fund what a lot of us believe are core responsibilities, but what we're continue to be told is that we're not core responsibilities through the city. That's why it's, 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 a, it's a hard decision because I don't think there's anyone around the table that doesn't believe in, the, in any of these organizations or believes in the actual value that they provide to our community. So giving them the same amount of money but then just spreading it out even thinner um, I think is causing some anxiety. Now, staff have chosen that we give 250 a year. There's nothing that says that council can't come back and say, well, I'm going to increase it instead of being 1% of our overall intake from OLG, I'm going to go to 1.5 or I'm going to go to 2% or whatever we want, correct? That is correct. Uh, the biggest reason for locking in the funding for the next two years is really to allow any transition to happen with the agencies. In two years time, council can adjust that funding pool as it sees fit. Um, and I think it's important to have, <coughs> excuse me, um, this funding pool really hasn't been adjusted for over a decade because it kind of gets dealt with, you know, on page 183 of the budget. Mm -hmm. And because of all the other pressures, it's tough for council to, uh, we just don't get into it. Uh, we don't spend the time on, on it. And, <coughs> excuse me, you know, I can probably bring up 30 charities here that will all talk about increasing needs and stuff. And that's why I think it's important for uh, a good evaluation to be undertaken uh, by people who have the time to actually invest into that. And they can bring recommendations back to council to say, listen, council, you know, we have an issue here. We think we need to raise the pool. And it's not just, oh, the agency saying it. It's an independent body that's also saying that. So my hope is, what I wanted to do was guarantee uh, the funding to the existing agencies, uh, and then give two years to build up a reserve. And you know, if it was my preference, uh, you know, I would like to see you know for targeted funding, or you may say, look, listen, and I'll pick on addiction for example. Uh, addiction is one of the <coughs> prime causes of what goes on in the street out there. Maybe we put more money into the pot, but we dedicate a new uh, sum of money for addiction. So it's 400000 for that, and we'll add $50,000 on for addiction. Now it's four hundred and fifty, But we're addressing these issues. That's important to the city of Niagara Falls. Um, you know, my, my, my hope is that, yes, we can get into a position uh, to, to move forward and look at reprioritizing potentially some of where we spend our budget to higher priority items, including some of the social service agencies. Listen, it's easy for me to say this is not our responsibility. <coughs> Excuse me, but really it is our responsibility. At the end of the day, we, you know, our job is to create a community out there um, uh, that's sustainable both financially and socially. Um, and I think the way we're doing it right now, we're missing the mark to say we're only funding this amount of money, we're never going to increase it, and we're only going to give it to these agencies. I don't think we're... <coughs> excuse me, hitting, hitting what we want to do. So we're trying to move to a system that maybe we can accomplish those goals better. Yeah. Um, thanks, Your Worship. Uh, I appreciate that, Mr. Burgess, I guess. Um, I mean, that would be part of something that I would support is actually putting uh, more money than what we have in there right now, especially if we're going to have <coughs> more nonprofits that are going to be applying for the exact same amount of money. Uh, perhaps somehow we can work that into the recommendation. I think I would feel better. I know. Uh, Obviously, the organizations that were here tonight would feel better, and even the ones that haven't applied yet 
would probably feel better knowing that there's going to be a, a little bit more funds there uh, for everyone to access. The other topic that I wanted to talk about was the dedicated funding. And we heard a lot of the organizations talk tonight about dedicated funding. And I know that, um, I, I, I guess from their standpoint, they can't continually reapply and uh, leave their future in a holding pattern if their grant doesn't come through. And I know Mr. Burgess said that, you know, in a future report, that staff would be coming back with some, uh, I guess, um, uh, direction on the strategy that the committee would use. I would hope that uh, within that strategy, we, we, we talk about dedicated funding because it is important for these nonprofits to know their own future <coughs> instead of having to simply reapply every year, especially when uh, someone like Project Share, whose grant is almost $300,000 a year, we can't leave that in abeyance every single year. There needs to be some level of dedicated funding. So whether it's, you know, 50% of the funds or 70% of the funds are dedicated funding and the other 30% are on a, you know, on an annual grant system basis, you know, something of that nature, that has to be the strategy that ends up coming back to council. I don't think I would feel fair if I passed it on to a committee and it didn't have that type of strategy in place. So I think those are all my comments for now, Your Worship. Appreciate it. Thank you. Those are good comments. Yep, uh, Mr. CAO. Yeah, just on that comment, I, I'm a believer in core funding. Yeah. I believe, I'm a believer in multi-year funding. The reality is this funding technically is not core funding because technically any council in the last 10 years could have cut this budget line. And technically they would have had essentially 30 days notice, um, which again is an unfair system. Uh, that's why I thought it was important to put a two-year guarantee in. Uh, so no matter what change there was, a two-year guarantee of funding before we move to a system is, is greater than what any other government agency would, would give uh, on their funding. Um, so um, this concept of this was always guaranteed money, it was never guaranteed. It was always an annual budget decision that this council made. So um, I believe, and in, in, uh, in fact, in the comments in the staff report, I think that was one of the strengths of this funding was by accident it became core funding. And I think it's important to have uh, multi-year funding arrangements with agencies so that they can, they have some ass surety of it. It's efficient, they're not reapplying. It's like, here's, here's four years worth of funding, you have it, go do what you say you're gonna do and come back and report to our successes and then go back into another funding stream. Um, so we would uh, take that back, and I, you know, I, I am a big proponent of that. I just don't want the misconception out there that this was core funding, because in reality, stroke of a pen, any on any budget night could have cut their funding. Fair enough. Thank you for that. I've got Councilor McCoco and then Thompson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I've always been very conflicted about this because in our strategic plan, it talks about homelessness and housing, and I understand the term core responsibility. It is our responsibility, whether it fits the definition of core or not. But when you look at our budget to see how much we actually spend on homelessness and housing or addiction or mental health, it's almost nothing but it's in, it's in our strategic priorities. So I think when we're working on our strategic priorities moving forward, um, I'm pretty sure that most of us as counselors, we, we campaigned on homelessness, um, affordable housing, maybe mental health, addiction, and a lot of the other candidates uh, did as well. I, I agree with Councillor Peter Angelo that it needs to be consistent, committed, dedicated funding. I, I think it's very difficult for the agencies to work through their year and not know that it's committed. Um, I, I know our CAO just talked about that we didn't even talk about addiction, that there was nothing in there, but I look at it as a, as a cycle. It might not hit everyone, but someone who's addicted becomes homeless, maybe mental health, um, food insecurity, so it is a cycle. So one might start and then the cycle starts and you keep going around, so it, it could affect all of them. I'd like the idea of the committee with experienced people to give us ideas, but I didn't really like the idea that the committee would choose the funding. <laughs> I would like to increase the funding, as Councillor Peter Angelo said, but I think this committee should be an advisory committee, that they give us advice based on their expertise, and then council can decide which way to go at that point. I do believe that it would be watered down if we just kept the 400,000 and opened it up to other organizations. So I think it's important that we look at maybe dedicated um, amounts consistent for certain organizations with the ability to apply. Uh, as we heard, GROW is a, um, a great example. They would like to apply. And then in, in addition to that, 
I think that we also need to provide, not that we need to provide, but maybe it would be helpful if we <coughs> gave some direction to some of these agencies of some of the other funding or resources that we know about. For example, if you're a nonprofit, maybe you can apply to um, get the taxes waived or different things like that. Some of them know about it, some of them don't. So if we can't help them one way, maybe we can help them with some resources. And my final comment, I'd like to put a recommendation forward that the recommendations that are listed, the six recommendations, that we break them down. I personally support some of them, but I don't support some of them, some other ones. So if we take it as one report, I don't know how we're going to go through those recommendations. So that would be my motion that we break those, those recommendations down individually. So what we could do, uh, there's a suggestion, we could split them and do six different votes. Correct, yes. Yeah, and then uh, you can vote on each one, amend it, send it back, whatever we wanna do with each yes. one. So if we do break it up into the six, will you give us an opportunity if we want to speak on each one of them? Yes. Or should, okay, yep. that, that's fine, thank you. Okay, great. So we'll go to Councillor Thompson. Um, we've always been able to look after these things in the past. And I don't think, uh, as with the uh, casino handing us $6 million, um, we don't have any, we're the luckiest <coughs> municipality. And I don't like to s the idea of having a committee, um, I would think the whole council has to be involved with the, the details of all of the issues with the budget and with the uh, people who are um, in, have trouble in the community. So uh, it's gonna be interesting. Okay, so if there's no further comments at this point, what we'll do, and, and, and I'll tell you, and since we're done the discussion, I'll throw in my two cents as well. Like at the end of the day, we make all the final decisions. Everybody makes it recommendations to us. This council makes all financial decisions. So regardless of what a committee comes up with, their suggestions and guidance. And um, so now we've got six recommendations. So I need a motion, uh, and help me through this, clerk, so we don't get in... Uh, go down the wrong path. We, we need to put this on the floor and then split them and then vote on each one individually so that we can deal with the, each one on its own. I think we could entertain a motion for just recommendation number one, get a mover and a seconder, open that up for discussion okay. uh, before we make any amendments to what is written in recommendation number one. Okay, so motion by Councillor Patel, uh, seconded by Councillor Strange that we uh, moving recommendation number one. Now, we're not gonna vote on it until we discuss it. So it's just to get it on the floor, right? So we're following proper procedure. Okay, so um, we're, now we're not, we're gonna start discussion now. We're not gonna call the vote, we're just gonna have discussion. So who would like to address, so recommendation number one, the 2023 funding levels and classifications for boards and commissions <coughs> fee service, grants and honorariums is presented in the attachment, totaling 7.5 million, approximately, will be funded by the tax levy, presenting a decrease in tax levy funding of $126,000. Be deferred to the 2023 budget deliberations. Sorry, I missed that last part. <laughs> Councilor Coco. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I was going to approve it because it was saying it was being deferred. Um, I guess I'll explain. So the, the second one is about the, the 200,000 to the one foundation. I would like to talk to that one. I was going to talk to number two, but the 200,000 is in this chart and for number one. Okay, um, let me just see. So where are you talking, are you talking in the? Um, in attachment number one. And no, we don't under have to. grants, one foundation, it's to 200,000. But that's recommendation two on the recommendation. Oh, I see what you're saying. So if I if I don't approve the two hundred thousand, I can't approve number one recommendation. When I could just not approve number two. Do you see what I'm saying? Yes. Yeah. So we we don't have to do them individually, as Councilor Pierangelo I think is suggesting. I mean, we could do two at a time. I mean, it's whatever it's the will of council. 
So we could change that. Could could number one just be that we defer the the to the capital discussion next week and not put any Actually, dollars? it's next year, I believe, right? No, no it's next week. Could we just defer it till next week and not put any dollar amounts? Oh, yes. And then right. that attachment number one isn't tied to it. Um, well, let's, Mr. You know. You're deferring both. You defer both one and two. No, but I have an issue with number two, so I want to talk to number two. We're going to deal with two first. Yeah. Okay. You want to do that then? So sure. can I get the mover? <laughs> And the seconder to uh, stand down on your motion, then we'll, do, would you like to move the second one then so we can deal with number two? Okay, so Councilor Patel, Councilor Strange, uh, move and second, recommendation number two. So go ahead, Councilor Coco. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. We, we spoke about the hospital funding last, last meeting and I would like to defer this. Um, Every year we've been putting $50,000 towards the One Foundation and they, they've asked us to purchase an MRI. And that's sort of linked to our hospital commitment. Technically hospital commitment is not a city responsibility, it's a provincial responsibility. And I'm really concerned that if municipalities keep on taking this responsibility that the provincial government is not going to cover it. I would, my suggestion would be to do the 50,000 and once we get to the um, discussion of our contract with the hospital foundation for the hospital that that be addressed at that time. I don't believe that we should be purchasing equipment at this time. The province really needs to step up. So I, I, I would, that, that's why I wanted to break these down. Okay. Uh, I don't know, Mr. CAO, if you wanted to weigh in on this and then I've got Councillor Newestay. Yeah, sure. Um, this came up because when we were looking at the social services, council directed us uh, in la during last budget discussions to reach out to all the social services and talk about changes uh, for the grant program. The hospital was one of the agencies that for over a decade this, this council decided to fund at $50,000 a year. Um, when we were getting in discussions with the hospital foundation, uh, they were looking for a way to exit from the grant program. They understood, you know, that we had budget constraints. Uh, they did have an opportunity to do a bulk purchase of MRIs. Um, and, you know, the, what we had discussed was we'd give them a one-time payment and then they would stop asking uh, for the money. It's, you know, I'm sure if they gave their presentation tonight, they would put a PowerPoint presentation up and say, oh, all the great things. And this is where it's difficult, you know. Um, you know, I'm, I'm deciding between, uh, you know, a woman who's abused in an abusive situation and someone who requires uh, medical help because, you know, they're facing a death issue. It becomes very impractical for staff or, frankly, counsel to make those decisions. Um, the hospital foundation had agreed to, um, you know, take a one-time payout and get off of this funding stream, which uh, you know, which we thought was a reasonable approach for the, for that organization. Um, at the end of the day, uh, communities fund uh, equipment in hospitals. It's been that way for I don't know, 50 years, I think. Um, and you know, that's why hospital foundations are there. So whether it's done through um, you know the levy or through individual donations. Uh, it's no different. Other charities are funded by donations uh, from the community and the hospital is funded by donations through the community. We've decided to, uh, at this council, take levy dollars and put that through to charities. Um, so the province, you know, I can also ask the province to step, step up for Project Share. I can ask the province to step up for Women's Place. I can ask the province to step up from some, somebody else. Um, you know, I get into these debates with staff all the time. The last time I checked, I only have one wallet, and one check goes into one wallet. And whether it's whether I'm paying for it with provincial tax dollars or federal tax dollars, donation or municipal tax dollars, there's only one taxpayer at the end of the day. Um, so it's really a decision of council of whether this is a priority for them, and, and to go from uh, to take it off the levy altogether or to make a one-time last payment. The condition that we would put into the report with the agreement with the $30 million that staff will be recommending um, is that uh, there's no more, there's no more asks of the, uh, of city council while we're, while we're making that 25 year commitment to the, to the hospital for, um, uh, for the new build. 
So sorry for the long-winded answer, but that's where it came about. Because this was always grouped with these other charities, I treated them equally as with all the other charities. I didn't put one saying one had more provincial authority or, or the other because I can argue that the city has no responsibility in any of these. And it's very hard for me to pick which one the city does or does not have responsibility for because I can make the argument we have none of any of these charities. Um, they're the only one who came up with a solution to to not ask for more money. They asked for a one-time thing to get off the, the, you know, the stream of funding. And to that point, yes. when you're talking about the hospital and, and funding from the province, and I, 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 I don't know if it was last council meeting or uh, uh, you, you talked to us about what percentages are for outside the hospital and what, and what we are in charge of for inside, like equipment and that, if you could just give us a little. Uh, so for the new built hospital, local share is responsible for five or ten percent, Tiffany. Five, ten percent, and a hundred percent of the equipment, furniture, and fixtures. So the province is, is ninety percent of the build. Of the building. And we're in charge of all the inside. Essentially, yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and that's done through either donation, municipal contribution, um, or through hospital-owned revenue. Uh, and in this case, if I go back to the presentation, I think the hospital is generating ninety million dollars worth of parking and food concession revenue to pay for uh, uh, their fit out. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, so Councillor Lococo still has the floor and I've still got Councillor Neustag uh, patiently waiting and Councillor Peter Angelo not patiently waiting. So that's good. <laughs> thank, thank you, Mr. Mayor. <coughs> yeah, and, and then Councillor Strain jumped the queue, so, you know. In, in, in a year that we're looking at cutting a whole bunch of things to get our tax levy down, um, the original was 50,000. Now we're looking at bumping it up to 200,000. And I understand that we won't be paying that for a number of years, for any years after that. I, I do get that. But at some point we're gonna have to, we're, we, will, we will be negotiating with the hospital funds about what our commitment is. There'll be a contract signed. And we're all looking at cutting things and you know trying to keep the amount of services. And I just don't see adding $150,000 now when we're going to be giving them over $30 million in the near future. So that, that's why I wanted to break these recommendations down, but the first recommendation includes the second recommendation in it, so that's why we're here. Yep, fair enough. Yes, Mr. Cielo? Yeah, just for clarity, the $200,000, what's being proposed is it comes out of reserve, and that's why it reduces our levy actually this year. So we're not gonna levy for that, we're just gonna take it out of reserve, uh, and that's a reduction in, in the levy. And that's why I think Councillor Peter Angelo had asked questions about how did the levy go down? It's because we're taking a lump sum out of the reserves to, to match this one. Thank you. To, to that point, just as the CAO said, there's only one wallet, whether it's the levy or it's money that we would spend for OLG for something else for recreation, it's still all the same money. Maybe it doesn't, I did mention levy, but maybe it doesn't affect the levy, but it does affect our taxpayers that we're taking that money out and not being able to use it for another service for them. Okay, thank you for that. I've got Councillor Neustag. I just wanted to speak to um, Councillor Lococo about um, the equipment. So being a member of the, of the hospital foundation for many, many years, um, just to reiterate, the hospital does not, or the government, provincial government, does not provide equipment. It's raised, we go out, we do all kinds of fundraising to um, raise the equipment. So even if we stop here um, providing it, doesn't mean that the province is going to step up and and provide um, the MRI, they will not. So it comes back to us. Um, I think it's um, made a good opportunity right now to say goodbye to the foundation, let them go off and do um, the raise monies that way so it will free up money in the future for these other social agencies. So the fact that they're um, giving us a pass to one time and then go on, I think it should be something we should consider. Um, yes to the new hospital, they will be, we will be looking at um, in more grants that way as well, but that's um, separate to this MRI that's needed very strongly right now. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, to that point, yes, Councillor. Th thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, through the Mayor to Councillor Neustig, you said that um, if we fundraise for, for that, if they don't come, it would come back. So it, it can't come back to the city that we can't keep on paying for. I, I guess what I'm trying to say is the fundraising has always gone to purchase the equipment in the hospital. It wasn't a city responsibility other than the $50,000 that we had in there. So if the fundraisers can't raise the money, they're not coming back to the city for the money. But under this, 
we're paying 200,000 when we should have only paid 50,000 and I know we're all trying to cut things. So I just wanted to make that clear that if they couldn't fundraise, they're not coming back to the city. Is that correct? Well, they could, I should say, they have come in the past. I know when Mike Somerville was uh, executive director, they did come with higher amounts and then finally we picked a number. Sustainably, instead of him coming every year and we start fresh, we just said, we'll do it 50 a year. We came up with that, but they have come asking for a specific piece of equipment. So yes, the ask could be anywhere. That so was they just could come, but it's not our responsibility. Right. We haven't um, agreed to it. Right. We didn't pledge Correct. for it. Okay, I just wanted to confirm that. Thank you. Yes, you got the actually, floor, Councillor. Actually, it gives us an opportunity that they now are saying they're not going to come no. back. So it, it provides us a very easy um, exit. Yeah. So this is a, a nice exit where we can now continue on looking at all these other much needed social agencies. Um, that's that's it. Mm -hmm. Yes, Mr. CAO is going to weigh in on that point as well. Yeah, this is where we differentiated the hospital from the other social agencies. We were going to lock the other social service agencies in for two years, and then they could apply to the new fund. The hospital was being excluded from any future applications, and that was the difference. We'd pay them essentially out over four years, guarantee their funding. Uh, we're doing it as a lump sum just because it's easier to do it that way. And then we would, uh, but then they're not allowed to you know, essentially come back unless a future council decides to entertain it. But the intent is we're going to, it'll take us a, a lot of time to, to build back up our reserves for whatever the hospital, whatever this council decides to pay to the hospital. Um, and this just cleaned up um, this granting program that we had with the hospital. So there is a difference. You know, when we switch for the other agencies, they're all going to be able to come back and apply to whatever the new fund is. The hospital is will be out. It's a one-time payment and then they're done. One final comment to that point. And again, the hospital is getting 30 million plus in a little while. The other organizations are not. That's my issue. They're getting a lot of money later on. And if we can save $150,000 now, that, that's where I was going. So I, I don't need to talk about it any further. I just wanted to break them down so we can vote on them. Thank you for that. I yeah. just want to... Yeah, go ahead, Councillor. Um, the 30 million is for a brand new is for our new hospital. Totally a separate. Um, I think that almost has to be looked at separately. It's a it's a blessing that we're finally getting this brand new hospital. So that I, I don't think should even be part of this um, other discussion about the 200,000. I think it's totally separate. Thank you. Thank you for that. And patiently waiting, Councillor Peter Angelo. Thanks, Your Worship. I guess through you to Mr. Burgess. Um, I understand that we have to uh, locally raise funds for equipment. Um, so the one-time payment of $200,000, I know it says that it's going to go as the overall contribution towards a new hospital, but whether a new hospital is getting built or not, um, our hospital still needs a new MRI machine now. Um, they're not going to wait another, let's say, six years to purchase this equipment, are they? I mean, this equipment is being purchased now. I think you've just negotiated that whatever I give you now is going to count over on that side. But realistically, I mean, the fact is that we need an MRI machine now. It's not really going to be for the new one. It's going to be for this one here. Sale? Yeah, the, uh, my understanding uh, from the presentation is they're trying to do a bulk purchase so they can buy multiple MRIs uh, and then they get delivered over a period of time. Uh, it, the MRIs could land before the hospital, but they will be transferred uh, to the hospital. Uh, and two hundred thousand dollars does not buy an MRI. Uh, it's just they have this opera. They've they've raised money uh, to do it, and they were able to get essentially uh, a bulk purchase discount on the MRIs. Um, and that's why that's the other motivation to give them kind of a lump sum two hundred thousand because that helps them do secure that purchase uh, for it. So they were because. Um, you know, frankly, they came to ask us for more than $50,000, and this is where we got into the discussion about I started off at zero, they started off at more than 50, you know, more than 50. we ended up uh, into a situation where um, they, they were very satisfied, and I think uh, we un, unhook ourselves from donating to the hospital over a period of time. Yes. Uh, are you uh, finished, Councillor Peter Angel? Yeah. Yes? Okay. Councillor Lococo? I'm trying to understand all of these different grants about they're not guaranteed, so even the $50,000 next year wasn't guaranteed, but we're negotiating it like it was. So we're not going to the other agencies negotiating different amounts for them, but we did with the hospital. 
So I just want to put that there. It wasn't that they were guaranteed $50,000 for the next few years, but you've negotiated 200000 for this year. Mr. Cielo? I uh, thank you. No, the counselor is correct. Uh, we we had discussions with each of the agencies. We said, listen, grant pressure is is an issue. It's not a core uh, item. Um, you know, we asked them a number of questions, and we asked consistent questions to all the agencies. We asked one of the questions is, what happens if the city stopped uh, funding you? What would be your response? Um, you know, are there any other things that we can do uh, to support the agency other than monetary uh, amounts? Um, you know, and we went through that. It happened to be that when we were having that meeting, they came to pitch us. Uh, you know, they're saying, "Well, you're talking about a reduction in in funding, and we're we're going to be asking for more because we we have this opportunity." Um, you know, if any of the other <coughs> agencies came to me and said, um, "You know, give me three years worth of funding, and then I won't ask you for the next ten years," I would entertain that. You know, I'd bring that to council just like I did this one. If you know, if if uh, if Women's Place or someone else said, you know, contribute to a capital campaign uh, versus an operational campaign, I think that's something I would bring back to council. So this was just an idea that came up during the negotiations. I, I thought it was uh, a reasonable um, idea for both the city and you know they've obviously agreed to it. Um, so I presented it to council. Um, that's why it's before council to make the decision. Council can reject it and you know and that and that's the decision of council okay um any other kicks at this horse are we uh so are we ready to call the vote on number two <laughs> okay so yes uh councillor newstead nope um no no we've got number two recommendation number two on the floor um, so this is for the hospital equipment for the MRI. This is the 200,000 one time versus 50,000 a year. That ends. The 50,000 a year ends and it's one time up front 50,000. Uh, Councilor Patel, you second it. Yep. So is there any questions about what the motion is? No? Okay, we'll call the vote. All those, yes, yes, oh, sorry guys. Yes, so Councilor Patel. So are we uh, voting for in favor of the motion or yes. against the motion? In favor. Yes. Okay. And it's for the recommendation. Okay. I just want to clarify that. Thank you. That's okay. Yes. It's better to ask now <laughs> than after we vote. So we, we, we've experienced that. Yes. Yes. Yeah. We've gone down the wrong path a few times. So it's for approval of the two hundred thousand dollars. All right. We're all clear. Yep. All those in favor. Okay. Opposed. Okay. One opposed. So that one's approved. All right. Now we're going to go to number one. Uh, I need a mover for, yes, Councilor Peter Angelo? I move one, three, four, five. You, you didn't sound confident, okay? So okay. one, three, four, and five, okay? Do we have a seconder? Councilor Neustag, okay? So uh, recommendations one, three, four, and five. Moved and seconded, did you wanna speak to it, Councilor? Well, could we speak to the one we're voting on, though? <laughs> <laughs> and then well, speak to that one later? Yeah, but I don't want to speak to that. Yeah, but okay, so you don't want to speak, because we got to focus on the one we're voting on right. first. So we just hang on to number six for, for a minute? Sure. Okay. That's why I didn't Okay. So you don't want to speak to those ones? Okay. Yeah, but you did. You just moved it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. He doesn't have to speak. No, no, you don't have to. I'm saying, you did. would you like to? Oh. Okay. You're good. Okay. Uh, okay. Yes, seconded by Councillor Strang. Uh, Councillor Newesteg. Okay, Councillor Campbell. Uh, can I have a clarification on number three? Okay, I'll ask our CAO to give clarification on the honorarium. Yeah, uh, Ms. Clark or, uh, or Ms. Moldenhauer can certainly support. Um, this is a movement away from an annual honorarium to a per appearance honorarium. Uh, so for the town crier, instead of paying $1,500 for the year, uh, it's $75 per appearance. And the historian also, correct? Yes, but that position's vacant. Yeah, oh, well, that's true. That position's vacant. So if we get a historian, then be $75 per, but it's mostly for the town crier. <laughs> He's free right now. So. So that so that's all it is. It's just that now he now when he shows up he'd be be paid seventy five dollars per appearance. 
which is similar to some of the other arrangements we have. You good on that one, Councilor? Yes. Okay. Uh, I just needed the clarification. Okay, thank you. Councilor Coco. For number four, it's talking about the framework. Will that include an advisory committee and not just the um, committee that the staff talked about? Because a few of us talked about council wanting to approve it, but if you read that, it's an independent committee for social and health funding. Yeah. So as long as it's an advisory committee, mm -hmm. four would be fine. I, mm -hmm. I think I use the term independent to mean no no counselors. It was to be without council uh, counselors okay. is what it is. But we'll we'll provide options like different variations of that uh, that. And at the end of the day, as the mayor said, at the end of the day, you guys approve all the cash uh, anyway. So it, it would it'd be framed, and then we'll bring back terms of reference. Council can then decide on the terms of reference and set it up as they see fit. Okay, that's great. The only challenge I have with lumping <coughs> one, three, four, and five, the 200 is in number one. The 200 MRI is in attachment number one on recommendation number one. So okay, we can't well then why don't we together. do one separate and then we'll do, we'll do the rest as a block. Okay, if we're good with that? Sure. Okay, so right now we're gonna vote on, uh, the mover and the seconder are okay with that? Mover and the seconder? Okay, great. So we're gonna move, vote on recommendation number one Okay, to approve one, and that it be deferred to the budget deliberations. Okay, all those in favor? Okay, and uh, opposed? And okay, with one opposed. And now we're gonna vote on three, four, and five. Okay, are we all good on that? Does everyone wanna take a second just to look at them? So three is that it's $75 per event honorarium for um, like the town crier as an example. Number four, that the framework, well, they're gonna come, staff will come back to us with a framework on this, the advisory board that's independent in that there's no elected officials on it. And number five, that those four groups listed there, two years, they know what they're gonna be, uh, there's not gonna be any risk to their funding. Okay? All right, so we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Uh, unanimous, yes. Two years, they're set. Yeah, project sheet. Um, what was that, Wayne? No, no, the council's still going to decide. There's going to be a committee to advise, make a recommendation. Yep, okay, that was unanimous. Thank you. Now, number six, uh, Councillor Peter Angelo. Thanks, Your Worship. I just want to go back to some of the comments I was making previously. So, the the 250 in OLG money is going to be added to the 150 from the operating budget to total 400, which basically <coughs> is what we give now. And again, if we're gonna be opening it up to more organizations in our municipality, I, I, I don't really wanna take the, uh, the same pie and cut it into smaller pieces. Um, I would rather add to the pie if we're gonna be adding more, uh, more eaters, I guess you could, you could say. Um, so in that sense, uh, I mean, I would think something reasonable to start with would be 350 of OLG reserve <coughs> funding. Um, uh, staff can comment back or whether you wanna go to one and a half percent because I think that 250 represents 1%. So. Um, can we get some feedback from our CAO? Sure. Yeah. Um, for the social services grant, because um, we'd like to probably do core funding, we'd like to fix the amount versus a percentage of revenue. Uh, because the percentage of revenue can vary and it'd be better just to fix uh, an amount uh, to the dollar amount and that way you can essentially guarantee the amount of funding and at that level it's pretty safe. So I think if you'd like to change it to 350 we would just prefer to keep it as a fixed amount that that way the pot is known and that we're not adjusting it based upon percentages. Okay, okay. so 350 then in essence will bring it up to a total of 500,000 instead of the 400,000 that we currently give away. And then the other comment about dedicated funding, I guess that would come back as part of number four, That's right. when the terms of reference come back? Okay, then I'm happy, Your Worship, to uh, move six and move it up to 350 of OLG reserve funding. Okay, motion by Councillor Pierangelo, seconded by Councillor Campbell, that the 
Number six, recommendation number six, that $350,000 of OLG reserve funding dedicated to social service and health grant funding effective January 1st of this year. Okay, does everyone understand the motion? All those in favor? Okay, and that's unanimous. All right, thank you, that didn't take too long. Whew. Okay, now on to the planning portion of our agenda, which I think there's some people anxiously, anxiously awaiting. Is there uh, somebody who turns the heat up? The, some heat up, that's a great idea. <laughs> it's a little, I don't know, where's uh, Eric? Eric's gone, he must. It's, it's actually Kathy's team. Oh, it's Kathy's team. Yeah, so it's hot on this side. It's hot on that side? <laughs> really? Yeah. I see your gallery, they started a campfire up there in the, in the gallery, so it's not a good idea. Even our WeStream guys, he's putting his parka on, so he's getting ready. All right, uh, Mr. Clerk, would you please introduce the next item on the agenda? The public meeting is now being convened to consider a proposed amendment to the city zoning bylaw to rezone the subject lands for two site-specific R1E zones at 7961 Booth Street. Notice was given by First Class Mail in accordance with the Planning Act on December 15th, 2022, and by posting a sign on the property in question. Anyone who wants notice of the passing of the zoning bylaw amendment to participate in any site plan process, if applicable, or preserve their opportunity to appeal to the Ontario Land Tribunal, shall give notice to the city clerk immediately after today's public meeting or by signing the sign-in sheets located outside of council chambers. Thank you very much, Mr. Clerk. I now ask our planner, Nick DeBenedetti, to explain the purpose and the reason for the proposed bylaw amendment. Hello, uh, good evening, everyone. So here tonight we're discuss public meeting zoning bylaw application, AM 20, 22, 2279, 61 Booth Street. Applicant, Antonio Gallo. Agent is Mitchell Baker. And Mike Sullivan is in the crowd tonight. Basically, we're here to rezone, create a new lot, and to recognize the siting of the existing dwelling. The location is at the corner of Beaver Dams and Boo Street. Uh, those are the subject lands. Immediate around the subject lands are detached dwellings, uh, and they're looking at, at as a corner lot, the existing lot, and basically, we're here to the applicant has requested approval for a zoning bylaw amendment for 7961 Booth Street. The land is designated residential in the city's official plan. The land is zoned residential 1C. The applicant has requested a zoning bylaw amendment to facilitate a future consent application to create a new lot for a new detached dwelling and to rec recognize the siting of the existing dwelling on the retained lot with the site specific R1E zoning for each lot. Basically, part one, uh, they're asking relief for the exterior side yard. The requirement is 4.5 meters, uh, and it'll be down to 2.8. Also, there's asking relief for the minimum lottery for a corner lot from 435 square meters, uh, which is what they're requesting from the requirement of 450. The proposed zoning for part two is basically the minimum lot area. Uh, it's 360 square meters, the requirement is 370, and the minimum lot frontage is 10.97 meters, and the requiring is the 12. So at the open house, what we had on November 9th, there were concerns that, uh, uh, that were brought by three uh, emails, basically to deal with traffic. Transfer station staff will undertake a traffic count to determine whether a Three-way stop is required to the corner of Watson and Beaver Dams. There was a discussion about stormwater management. Stormwater management brief showed no adverse impact. A drainage and grading plan will be required at a condition of the consent. Uh, there was discussion about built form property values. Proposed new dwelling will comply with the, the same setback requirements as the surrounding dwellings, and staff had no evidence that the proposal will devalue the surrounding properties. And what occurred after that meeting is that the owner of the property had a, a separate meeting with the neighbor and the comments indicated those were the applicant comments. Basically not to install windows on the second floor facing the interior side yard um, and to construct a wood fence along the interior side abutting the neighbor for privacy. 
open space areas that may attract vermin and construction during the winter months would be avoided and the applicant or the owner offered to cooperate with the neighbor should there be any further concerns. Planning analysis. The proposal conforms with the provincial and regional and local policies that intensifies land within the built up area. The property is designated residential and is proposed to be used for residential purposes. The rezoning amendment application will facilitate the future creation of a new lot to construct a new single detached dwelling. The proposal allows for infill development intensification in the built up area. The, required, the requested reduction in the lottery for part one is minor and will have no noticeable impact. The decrease in exterior side yard is requested due to a road winding on beaver dams. And the requested reduction in lot area in frontage for part two will not negatively impact the surrounding lot fabric, streetscape or build form in relation to the other residential uh, dwellings in the neighborhood. So the bottom line is in our recommendation, the council approved proposed zoning by zoning bylaw amendment as modified and recommended in the report. Uh, thanks, Mr. De Benedetti. Are there any questions of members of council? Councilor Campbell. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, microphone, please, Councilor. I thought it was on. No? no. I'm sorry. Thank you. Uh, you you uh, suggesting that there's going to be a fence between the two properties, but you didn't indicate what the height would be. That, that could uh, range to comply with the fence bylaw. Uh, that was a discussion that the neighbor had uh, with the owner. They could technically go up as high as eight feet or they could keep it at the standard six feet. So that's to be decided. Yeah, between the neighbors themselves. Thank you. Are there any other questions of Mr. DeBendedetti? Okay, members of the public are advised that failure to make an oral or written submission at this public meeting will result in the Ontario Land Tribunal dismissing any referral it receives. Failure to notify the city clerk to preserve their opportunity to appeal will result in staff rejecting an appeal as per section 3419 of the Planning Act. Council will hear from anyone other than the applicant who wishes to speak to the proposed bylaw amendment. Mr. Clerk, is there anyone that wishes to speak? Uh, through the chair, there is no uh, members of the public registered online. We could see though uh, that uh, I see one gentleman in the gallery that has his uh, hand raised. So we'll just take any members from the gallery. Absolutely, sir, if you wanna come up, please. Um, if the clerk does not have your name and address, we just need you to state your name and address and then the microphone is yours. Aras Raisi, uh, 66 O'Neill Street. So thank you very much, council. <clears throat> I've looked at this application and carefully studied it, the proposal and the concerns of the neighborhood. I have to say that it, this, uh, I agree with the advice of the uh, staff that this, in fact, comply with our needs of the city. In fact, proposal like this, <clears throat> uh, council tonight is passing uh, amendment to the master plan that uh, we need projects like this. My concern that I raised to you, Mr. Chair, is that one of the app there, one of the concerns submitted was that uh, sewage water, if there's a new household built in my neighborhood, sewage water will back up my basement, it's gonna get flooded. If we recall, not this meeting, I believe a meeting before, there was another major development that we badly needed. The younger generation need housing. Uh, <clears throat> there was very passionate neighbors who came here and they said that, you know what, this project, again, the sewage system is gonna flood my neighborhood. And I know the professional came and said, no, 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 we, we studied this. As a young person, for me, it's important the neighbors fall at ease when we build housing because we badly need housing this, uh, across Ontario and Canada. I know that there's a RAP program, and this afternoon I checked, it was still on a website, and I believe it is still valid, and I know it worked for them in the past, and it's very uh, <clears throat> affordable program that helps people that they have this switch backlog program. I, I hope through the council that city do a better job of promoting this valuable pro program that the residents can have back full of water prevented installed in their system, as well as when we have a new application, if someone submit and says that, you know what, I have a concern about switch water, does the city would be able to help them out, promote this program to give an ease, because if the neighbors are uncomfortable, they will be up and arm, and they are not gonna prevent affordable housing. You know, tonight we, we heard about a lot of um, a great program they were talking about affordability. And uh, we had a lot of younger folks, a lot of lady, ladies, <clears throat> Gen Z. Housing affordability is something that we need to think about it. And I um, 
hope that uh, city could help the ease the neighborhoods that if the new housing is built in the neighborhood, it's not going to harm them. It's just going to create more taxpayers to lift up the city and help us to have a more taxpayers so we could think about long-term program with a fixed budget. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. Do we have any other speakers who would like to address council? Yes, if you... Okay, we'll get a response from him. If you can state your name and your address, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Actually, Mike Sullivan with Land Pro Planning representing the applicant. If, if I may, or is, am I... Should I wait? Yeah, we're if, we're, if we're finished with the public speakers, yeah. then we would have you speak. Yeah, so is there any other members of the public who wish to address council? Okay, all right, seeing none, let me... Um, members of the public are advised that failure to make an oral or written submission at this public meeting will result in the Ontario Land Tribunal dismissing... You did that already? Okay, great, thank you for that. I just wanted to make sure, I thought I'd give it a little extra impact. All right, council will now hear for the app from the applicant or his or her representative. So here's your chance to state your name uh, and your address, and you can address the concerns of the gentleman before you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Again, Mike Sullivan with Land Pro Planning Solutions. We are the, uh, the agents for the applicant. Uh, our office is in St. Catharines. Mr. De Benedetti did a great job in presenting, so I won't repeat what he said already. I'll just echo the fact that my client, the applicant, has gone to extraordinary lengths with the neighbor. Uh, to attempt to address their concerns. Mr. De Benedetti identified the concerns to council already, and I don't think I can really add to that. I have a, pre had a presentation ready, but in the interest of time, I don't think it's really necessary to get into. Mm -hmm. What I will note, if I may, Mr. Mayor, is uh, <coughs> there were several comments made by, made by the, the neighbor, and everything has been addressed saving except for the property value which Mr. De Benedetti spoke to and we're not of course not uh, specialists in that area but uh, everything everything has been addressed and we continue we are prepared to work with the neighbor as much as possible to maximize uh, privacy thank you okay thank you uh, are there any questions of counsel for Mr. Sullivan okay so we're all done all right thank you for that thank you the public meeting with respect to the proposed zoning bylaw amendment is now concluded. What is the direction of council? Councilor Thompson? Yes, I think we dealt with this before and uh, the, it's recommended by the, the um, planning department and it's the region and the province are are in favor so i would motion and for the approval. make the motion for the yes. recommendation okay yes. motion okay second by councillor peter angelo any discussion councillor lococo thank you mr mayor it's really nice to see that the applicant is working with the neighbors to address the concerns and i was wondering if mr david Denny, I'm sorry. De Benedetti. De Benedetti could answer about the RAP program. I, I was really interested in would that benefit future. Is there someone that could could answer that? Oh, we've got uh, Mr. Nickel would be the guy that could address this probably best. So I, I know that the RAP program could address the situation, but I mean for building um, and infilling and, and that issue. Mr. Nickel. Thank you. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, I'm always happy to promote our RAP program, our, um, our uh, regional and city funded RAP program. The RAP program is a program that allows homeowners to disconnect weeping tiles. From Can you say that slower? Because I think people think you're saying RAT. Oh, RAP. W R A P. <laughs> weeping Tile Removal Assistance Program. Thank yeah, you, thank Mr. You Mayor. Yeah. It's a program that's funded by both the region and the city to remove excess drainage flow from the sanitary sewer system. Um, that is a great program that can help residents who have experience with flooding in new construction. New homes are often built, and I think in the new building code, require a backwater valve. So they're protected from flooding from day one. Um, the RAP program, RAP program is one of the tools in our toolbox to address some of the wet weather challenges we're facing uh, through development charges, which are funded by developments coming forward such as this. We also fund our wet weather management strategy and our master servicing plan. So in a circular way, we're, we're addressing some of those wet weather challenges to try to make sure that we're reducing the impact of uh, wet weather flows to the sewer system and the overflows due to changing climate. 
Excellent. Thank, Thank you. you. Councilor? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So I, I guess my comment would be that if we ever have residents that are saying they're concerned about sewage and, and backflow in around a new build, could we give that information to, to the neighbors so they know about the, the program? Just as uh, Mr. Racy was saying um, that we need to promote the program, if a resident is saying I'm concerned <coughs> about the sewage, let's tell them about the RAP program. Okay, so we'll give that for our communications uh, to make sure everybody's aware of the wrap, wrap program. Okay, so we've got the motion seconded, call the vote, all those in favor. Okay, and that's unanimous. So thank you very much, Mr. Sullivan. Oh, and Councilor Peter Angelo, want to speak to this? Uh, no, not to this, Your Worship. So we're all done, we're all good, it's all yeah, approved. Thank you for that. Yeah, um, thanks, Your Worship. Sorry I didn't get a chance to bring this up sooner, but I do believe that we have some people that are sitting in the crowd on yeah. And the item is listed under our consent agenda, which should be easily to, which should be easy to deal with. I think it's 9.6, so I would make a motion that we bring that forward and deal with it now. I think it's been long okay. enough that they've waited. Motion by Councillor Peter Angelo to move forward 9.6 from the consent agenda. Uh, can I get a second on that? Councillor Baldinelli, all those in favor? Okay, that's approved. So you'll see um, there's an encroachment agreement with the city, and there are three recommendations of the city. Okay. I'll second. Yeah. Motion by Councillor Peter Angelo, seconded by Councillor Thompson. Yeah. Three recommendations. It's simply an encroachment uh, agreement on yeah. the Clifton Hill Road allowance. Are there any questions to the recommendations? Seeing none, all those in favor? Okay, and that's unanimous. Thank you. We actually wanted you to stick around longer because your body heat, you're heating up the room a bit, and we don't want people to leave. So thank you. Thank you. All right. <laughs> it's a what? Yeah. All right. Okay. <laughs> we should do that. Okay, where are we, Mr. Clerk? We, oh, here we go. Reports. Okay, guys, we're at uh, eight reports. <clears throat> 8.1. There's a Falls UBI request regarding the convention center, and there's a recommendation of staff that we first do the building assessment and financial review uh, until we deal with this and we're giving them until the end of next year to get that done. Yeah. So looking for a motion on the recommendation. Councillor Thompson. Yes, the, um, this is the conventions and the, the Falls View BIA had um, 15 million into the, and we're so lucky to have a convention send, and we have never put any money in this. To every municipality uh, is paying for years for a convention center. And, and we got, uh, actually it was mentioned in the report, 450,000 that was left over and it was in the city. Um, and we got it for the new uh, chairs in the, the theater, yeah. yeah. And that worked out very well. And uh, I, the Fallsview BIA all asked to have it wavered. And the last year, because of the, the uh, COVID situation and everybody's in trouble and they uh, waived it last year and the convention center also um, agreed with it and uh, they, um, you have to have Noel Buckley from the convention center uh, to uh, talk about this. He told us, and I'm the chairman of the convention and the chairman of the Fallsview 
BIA, and of course, all of the people are, are financially uh, hit by the uh, COVID, and they have a real serious air problem. And, but I think it's okay to uh, have a report mm -hmm. for the um, situation. And when it comes back, I think it's, um, it's the building is excellent and I think we will be okay with that. And also, financially, um, Noel Buckley, the top guy, uh, says even um, if we don't get the 750000 we're going to be okay. They're having a, a great um, uh, year this getting it all back. So I would uh, make the motion that we have the report regarding the, and then we can deal <coughs> with it. Uh, uh, at hopefully, um, at, if the um, top guy at the convention center says, um, we're we're going to be financially <coughs> okay. And they're putting money every year aside for um, uh, a, roof, a roof or, or a major problem. So anyway, I think that's a, a fair way of handling it. Yep, I agree. Yep. So we've got a motion by Councillor Thompson basically that First, we asked the convention center to get their building assessment and financial review done within the next two years, and then we'll deal, in the meantime, we'll defer the, the payment from the BIA. Second, by looking for a second, Councillor Strange. I do have a question. Yes, go ahead, Councillor Patel. Uh, uh, Mr. Mayor, the Fault Free BIA has made a commitment for $15 million, and I understand last year we, defer, we amended the payment for last year, and they're waiting for the assessment for what purpose? Because they still owe a million dollars, right? No. So what is the seven, reason for seven fifty? We'll get a uh, CAO to weigh in on it. Yeah. Yeah. We'll get the CAO to weigh in on it. Thank you. Thank you. The, um, the, the convention center has represented, and the BIA has represented that they have sufficient reserves to offset any cost of the building. We're the, uh, the city will, is the de facto owner of the building. They own the business. Um, and uh, what we want is that the convention center has enough money set aside to deal with any asset management obligations of it. Uh, so that's really what that money is for, is to continue to set that aside. If they can produce a building condition assessment that says they don't really need to put more money aside, that they have sufficient, then, you know, then that's, that's fine. They also have another option uh, under the lease where they have to maintain the building to a certain condition. So it's really a matter of, um, a deferral of that amount, but we just wanted to make sure that the building is in the condition that they're representing and that, that they do have sufficient funds set aside to, to maintain it. Okay, good question. Thank you. Councillor LeCocco. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. If, if the city owns the building and we <coughs> have to um, follow the asset management plan, so we have to make sure there's enough money. I don't know if I'm mixing two different pools of money, but can we look at the, the MAT tax, the municipal um, accommodation tax? I know it's the Falls View BIA, and the MAT tax is from the Niagara Falls Hotel Association, but is there something that we can look at from, from that pool of money to assist with asset management for the convention center? Ask our CAO to weigh in. Uh, the Hotel Association would have to consent to that. No. Um, and. Um, at the end of the day, the contract is really with the contractual obligation is really with the BIA, so they have to um, they have to put the money up. They could ask the hotel association. We can't direct those funds uh, in any manner. So uh, we just want to make sure that there's sufficient funds to take care of that building. Thank you, Mr. CAO. I do understand that we can't direct it, but I'm looking at a long term that if it is a city responsibility, we have to make sure that it is uh, kept up, that we do have asset management. So I was just trying to come up with some sort of other ideas. So if maybe we could 
put that to staff to come up with some other ideas that the city could um, find other revenue to assist with that, that might be helpful. Okay, thank you for that. Any other questions of council? Seeing none, we'll call that vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that's unanimous. Thank you for that. 8.2, official plan amendment. Recommendation that official plan number 149 be adopted and approved. Looking for a motion and a seconder. Motion by Councillor Strange. Looking for a seconder, Councillor Patel. Is there any discussion to the motion? Seeing none, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that's unanimous, thank you. 8.3, uh, there's some correspondence that's been added. Grassy Brook, Councillor Peter Angelo's has a conflict. Grassy Brook secondary plan. There are two recommendations of council. One, that council received the report, and secondly, council authorized staff to develop a terms of reference and advertise a request for expressions of interest. Yeah. Yes, motion by yeah. Councilor, yeah. Councilor Thompson. Looking yeah. for a sec, Councilor Patel, second. Uh, Councilor Lococo. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'll, I'll agree with the two recommendations, but I do, do remember that we had some landowners that presented to council and were concerned about specific parcels of land that's in this. Where, where does that sit and where does it sit? Um, also, about cons I'm concerned about green spaces in that area that we're going to turn, turn over into other types of um, use. So I, I'm fine with um, receiving the report and authorizing sta staff for terms of reference, but I'd like to find out about the uh, landowners that were concerned about the change of their zoning and then the green space as well. Okay. Uh, Ms. Dolch, our General Manager of Planning. Thank you, Worship, through you to the Councillor. So what we're requesting tonight is just to, to set up that focus group. Um, the residents' concerns that have been raised will continue, it will be addressed through the process of the secondary plan. Any residents that have additional comments, if they're not chosen for the focus group, can still participate in open houses, public meetings, all those other avenues. Um, in terms of of green spaces, we're doing the background work right now. The background work environmentally is being conducted right now, uh, so that's something we'll look forward to in the future, and will be presented to both the focus group, the technical advisory groups, all of them um, for consideration. Okay, good with that. Okay, thank you. If there's no further questions, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, that's unanimous. Maybe we can get Councilor Peter Angelo. Uh, he's what? Oh, he's got one. Okay, sorry about that. <coughs> Excuse me, 8.4, yeah. um, modification of a draft plan of vacant land condominium. There are four recommendations. Uh, yes, moved by Councillor Strange, seconded by Councillor uh, Baldinelli. Uh, any questions to the motion? Okay, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that's unanimous. Thank you for that. We'll now get Councillor Peter Angelo before we move forward. Okay, uh, 8.5, honorary street naming policy. Uh, yes, Councillor Peter Angelo, or Thompson, Thompson, sorry. I'll be okay. I'm waiting for Peter Angelo, talking to Thompson. Um, I, <laughs> Pretty much. I, I'm in, in favor of the St. Clair for Hebert. Uh, he was a great person and the, with, um, Queen Street with his uh, French fry wagon all the time. Yeah. And I don't like the um, limitation five years for the, you know, if somebody has done something <coughs> for 50 years, um, why would you um, uh, limit to uh, putting his name uh, for five years, I think we, and uh, um, also uh, we approved uh, um, five, six months ago, Al Fagan, and where is that uh, happening? The naming of uh, a street. Well, just before we get to that one, so, so you're saying the five years is your concern here? You yeah, would, no. 
per permanently. What's the matter with that? Well, maybe we'll get, maybe staff could, uh, just on that, can we get some input from staff on that? Uh, we got uh, Ms. Dolch. Well, uh, all of the uh, other uh, cities, um, I think there's one or two, and the majority don't have a Terms. limit. Right. Okay. So that's, I, <coughs> you know, what, five years. Yeah, that's, okay, well, let's hear from Ms. Dolch. Yes, Ms. Dolch. Thank you, Your Worship. Through you to the Councilor. Um, we, we reviewed a number of municipalities. Some used five years, some didn't have a time frame. Uh, we chose five years um, because things change over time. Obviously, you can pick it. It's an arbitrary number. You can pick any number, um, to be honest with you. So um, the conclusion is, is long term, the longer um, time goes by, say it's 30, 40, 50 years, that person um, and their families and things like that may not recall that person as well. So, um, and what was happening in certain cities in the U.S. in particular, so many in honor everywhere that it was getting confusing. And it started, it stopped being, um, you know, yeah. a respectful way to, to acknowledge somebody because it was everywhere. So yeah. by removing them, you give the ability back to the family to give them that sign, that street topper yeah. sign that they can place in their homes. Yeah. Um, if five years isn't enough, I'm happy to take council's yeah. direction on that. Okay, thank you for well, that. Uh, yeah. Councilor um, Thompson, you still have You know, what are you going to take? Fair and sign um, Sam Ira Fida. You're going to take all of the people. No, no, it's the part that goes on the top. It, this, oh. That's going to stay. It's the part on the top. Yeah. The honorary part. Yeah. yeah. Or I put it as as the permanent, uh, not on um, fire. See, that's not what this is saying. This is saying rather than change oh. the street because fire and ambulance and police. It, it, right, right, and addresses. Yeah. yeah. It'll be kind of expensive. It will cost quite a bit. Oh, yeah. 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 Uh, our CAO is going to weigh in. Yes, uh, Mr. Burgess? Yeah, I think uh, one of the solutions, if you want permanent naming, is uh, planning does have a naming list of streets. So when a new street comes up, if you want a permanently named street, yeah. there's a process for that, which is different than this process. So a permanently named street goes into a list that the, uh, the developers can uh, pick from. Uh, and that would be the permanently named street. This is more for, you know, a commemorative uh, item, uh, you know, yeah, and it, it could last for a few years, but it doesn't change the name of the street. Um, so I think, Councillor Thompson, there's still the option to, if council, for example, wanted to have a permanently named street or somebody else asked for a permanently named yeah. street, there's still an option for that. That's not what this report addresses. Yeah. This is just the, the honor. Someone named after him. Oh, he's already got a street named after He's got a building. <laughs> he's got lots of things. Yeah. yeah. So did you did you want to go with 10 years then on that? Is that more comfortable for you for the honorary part? Just the honorary part. That St. Clair is a, uh, I think there's what one or two houses on it, and it, and then Park Street. We could do the street uh, permanent. But that's not what this is, right? This is we're just talking about the honorary street naming. We're not no, talking about the that. People are saying. They want to to have something yes. to remember yep. the guy. So we can deal with that, but that's separate. Right now, we're just trying to deal with the honorary street naming policy. Not that. That's permanent. We'll deal with that. Just for now, we just want to do the honorary. So yeah, go ahead, Mr. C. A. O. Uh, another option is uh, you can extend. It could be a five-year renewable option too, if that's something we can yep. uh, take a look at. If uh, if you wanted to maintain it. The challenge is is that uh, you know you can run out of opportunities for uh, commemorative names, and that might be a problem for a distant council. But that's something that we can take a look at: is do it as a five-year term with an option that uh, can be done. That's another option. So you can do five-year renewable. Okay. We can do we'll, ten. And what will um, included our council to extend it. Okay. Okay. All right. So yeah. we've got that motion yeah. by Councillor Thompson, second by Councillor Strange, that we follow the recommendations, although it, but it's five year renewable uh, terms that will come back to Council. Okay. We'll call the unless vote. It's, unless it's Thompson. That's well, then it's fresh. It's permanent. That's, diff <laughs> that's different. Okay. All those in favor?
Okay, that's unanimous, thank you. <laughs> All right, we are at the consent agenda. Motion by Councillor Peter Angelo, second by Councillor Neustag to move the consent agenda. All those in favor? Okay, that's unanimous, thank you. Let's move along here to, okay, 10. Communications and comments of the city clerk. There is a recommendation from the clerk that we approve items 10.1 through 10.4. Motion by Councillor Peter Angelo, seconded by Councillor Baldinelli, that we approve 10.1 through 10.4. If there's no discussion to that, we'll call that vote. All those in favor? Okay, that's <coughs> unanimous. Thank you for that. And for anybody following along, that approved the Crime Stoppers of Niagara, January 2023, flag raising for Let's Talk. Uh, day in 2023 for January the 25th for mental health, flag raising for National Day of Bulgaria, which is March the 3rd, and lastly, proclamation for Multiple Myeloma Awareness Day on March the 31st. We're now at 11. Councillor Thompson. Um, Councillor Thompson, there's a recommendation from the clerk that we move items 11.1 .1 through 11.13. Motion by Councillor Thompson. Seconded by Councillor Strange. All those in favor? Okay, that's unanimous. Thank you for that. Um, let me just catch up here. 11.14. Okay, then we are at 12. Communications and comments of the city clerk. Item 12.1, Niagara Cherivan. Resident and active user um, Sandy Bird has sent us in some correspondence. Uh, Councillor Peter Angelo. Yeah, thanks, Your Worship. Um, I just wanted to comment from staff because I know that the information or the recommendation is that we send this to the Niagara Region Transit or the newly formed Niagara Region Transit. Um, who is going to be operating? <coughs> who is going to be responsible for chair van now that the Niagara Region Transit has started? Is it still going to be the City of Niagara Falls, or is Niagara Region Transit going to take over it? Uh, Mr. CAO? Yeah, the Transit Commission uh, uh, will uh, take over uh, that service and uh, they're maintaining their current supplier till they, uh, you know, until they consolidate. It, it, do they have a, an effective date that they're going to take it over? It was January 1st. It was January 1st, okay. So I, I guess the reason I asked the question is because I was told it was still going to be the municipality's responsibility for the next two years. But if that's not true and yeah. it rests with Niagara Regional Transit, well, we, then I can understand the recommendation. Yeah, we just funded, we, we provide the funding over, so. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. So did you want to receive the... Sure. Okay. So recommendation for the information of council, uh, motion that we received by Councillor Pietrangelo, <laughs> seconded by... I need some seconded by Councillor Patel. Okay, all those in favor? Okay, that's approved, thank you. Item 12.2, Victoria Center BIA Board of Directors. Recommendation that we approve the Victoria Center Board of Directors. Yep, motion by Councillor Thompson. Second. second by Councillor Pierangelo. Councillor Lococo. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I would like to approve it as well, but I've been at it as, as well. It's in um, the resolution later on in the meeting. My name's not on there now, but I have been added. Uh, you've been added to the Correct. list? Yes. Okay. Um, okay, so is nothing changes. Does anything change, Mr. Clerk? Uh, no, that'll get reflected in the in the bylaw passed later in this evening. Okay. What's that, Councilor Pierangelo? No, we're placed there as council representatives, right? So we can still vote on the actual board of directors. Yes. Yes. Right. Okay. We will call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved, thank you. Um, item 12.3, and now are we waiting for uh, Councillor Neustag, did she leave for a reason, or is, are we okay, like I didn't, she didn't excuse herself? Break, maybe. Okay, <laughs> no, right. no okay, okay. Uh, 12.3, Niagara Falls Library Board Appointments. Recommendation of Council appoint the following residents on the board, and you'll see them on your list. Well, yes, I just wanted to speak to this. Yeah. Yep, and I, so, Maybe the city clerk can help me out with this. Have the have the applications uh, to apply to these different boards have they been sent out or? Because the last time I looked, there was no 
I tried to find an application on the city website and it couldn't be found. Yeah, so through the mayor, <clears throat> the I'll speak about the library board first. Yep. Uh, that application process commenced uh, earlier uh, because it does have to follow legislation. They're under timelines. So we okay. got that ball rolling a little quicker. And they were looking for eight members. They had seven apply, five of which are returning members. The two new ones were interviewed and the uh, the panel interview panel is recommending those seven. Uh, they'll fill the one vacancy on their own. The rest of the committees, uh, that application process went live today. today okay. uh, so if you're looking for any assistance, just let us know, but uh, that'll, that's gone live to our website today. They'll have until February 10th for all those other uh, committees that we're looking for members of the public to apply to. Um, then we'll bring those back to council uh, at a meeting in February for approval. Okay, and is it a policy now that they get interviewed now on different uh, no, not necessarily. Just the uh, library? I know the terms of reference for some of our committees last year had that, uh, for example, uh, anti-racism. Uh, um, and then the library board did put together uh, or updated their terms of reference where they were looking to do interviews this year. The bulk of the public committees would not involve an interview process. Okay. Just I just had concerns because the last council meeting I brought up about um, there was one committee with the two committees trying to go together, the anti-racism and um, Wayne Campbell's committee. What What is the committee called? Diversity. 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 Yeah. So I, I asked, because they said, oh, we're, we're going to allow these members because <coughs> they accepted all of them from last year, which I found out right after one girl phoned me and applied and got interviewed last year and didn't get accepted. So that wasn't true that she was accepted to that committee from last year for some reason. So it's kind of odd that everyone's accepted for the, except for this person. And that person is on the same committee at her workplace. So I found it really odd. So maybe I can get you, Bill, to approach her or talk to her about that possibility of getting her on um, that committee this year, if possible. Because she was interviewed last year and she was not accepted, where Ms. Moldenhauer said everyone was accepted from last year. Yeah, through the chair, if you want to uh, forward me that information, I'll pass that on to the committee liaisons and ultimately will be council's decision as to who they appoint. Okay, perfect. And then the rest of the committees will be, um, the uh, appointment process will be on the website starting, it started today. Okay, perfect, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, Councillor Lococo. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I think there's some confusion. Not everybody who was interviewed was placed on the committee. Everybody who made it on the committee was to return for the following year. So say, I don't know what the numbers were, but say there were 20 applications, and out of the 20, six went there to the diversity and inclusion if they wanted, and six went to the anti-racism. That's 12, which leaves eight people that didn't get appointed. So not everybody who was interviewed got appointed. But for the two committees that people were appointed, if they apply, then they'll continue on for this term. So, so there they, was some they confusion. Get to stay out for five years instead of Correct, for a new term because it was only 18 months for the last one. Okay, um, so for the library, I'm sorry, did we do a motion? I don't know. No. Okay, need a move and a second on the library board recommendations. Uh, Councillor Campbell makes a motion, Councillor Lococo seconds it. If there's no discussion, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved unanimously. Now 12.4, the downtown, downtown BIA slate of officers. Um, just find the, uh, so they've put forward a slate. Yeah, okay, our CAO is going to speak, or our uh, clerk, sorry, is going to speak. <laughs> <laughs> so I know the councillors had received a lot of emails uh, the last few days about this. Uh, really, it's just a, 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 a formality, a bit of a ratification here. Council at their last meeting already appointed 12 members that were. Uh, looking to, <coughs> to be on the board. Uh, this just specifically names them. It also will name the past chair as a non-voting member as per their governance documents. Uh, it also names a staff person as a liaison uh, and then uh, formalizing that Councillor Campbell is also on that chair. It's told, uh, told to me by the executive director that this process of just getting council to approve this uh, will assist them for documents that they may have to give to a bank, uh, insurance companies, uh, so on and so forth. If they could just have one letter from us as the clerk, um, 
advising of what council's direction was tonight. They will still have their meeting on January 30th to appoint the executive positions, such as treasurer or so on. Uh, that is not what this is. Uh, this is uh, just as I explained. Uh, they'll still have their meeting on the 30th. Okay, thank you for that. So we got a motion by Councillor Strange, seconded uh, by Councillor Campbell. Is there any discussion? Yes, Councillor Peter Angel. Yeah, just one question, Your Worship. I'm not <coughs> sure if it's, uh, I'm not sure if we're taking the actual names um, from the letter from the downtown, but number 14 on the list um, doesn't have a last name. So. <laughs> Tim. <laughs> like Madonna. He says the first name. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Who's that guy? Oh, that's Tim. <laughs> we'll call him Tim. Yeah. The tool guy. Oh, yeah, Mr. Yeah. Mr. Uh, Clerk? We'll make sure that that says Tim Treadwell on the okay. Treadwell. There, there you go. go. Much better. Good catch. Good catch. Okay. There's a motion second. If there's no further discussion, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay. And that's unanimous. Thank you for that. Are there any notices of motion? Councillor Lococo. Sorry, Mr. Mayor, it's not a notice of motion. I just don't know if Tim Treadwell is accurate. Tim Treadwell is on the library board. I think it's uh, Tim Pow yes. or po I don't know how to oh, say it. Oh, oh. Sorry. <laughs> I'll make sure we have it See, right. But you go. Yes, <laughs> you're, you're right. That's why, that's why I had Mr. Treadwell's name in my head. Good. <coughs> Good call. Okay, so there are no notices of motion. We do have two resolutions. Um, first up, Resolution of Council Federation of FCM, election to the board of directors. Uh, I understand that we have a member of council who is interested in putting your name. Yes, Councilor Lococo. Thank you. I'd like to put my name forward. I'll move the resolution. I'll second that. Okay. Motion by Councilor Pierangelo, seconded by Councilor Campbell, that we move uh, Councilor Lococo's name forward uh, as a potential member of the Board of Directors of FCM. If there's no further discussion, we'll call that vote. All those in favor? Okay. And that's unanimous. I won't vote. You're not going to vote, right? Okay. Unanimous without Councillor Lococo voting. And item 14.2, resolution of council, uh, modification of a draft plan of vacant land and condominium on Kaler Road. Uh, we're looking for a mo uh, approval. Okay, motion by Councillor Newesteg, seconded by Councillor Strange. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved with Councillor Peter Angelo declaring a conflict. Now ratification of in camera, Mr. Clerk. Uh, yes, Council met earlier this afternoon in camera for a couple of matters uh, stemming from that. Uh, that Council approved the sale of land within the Montrose Business Park being parts 11 and 15 on reference plan 59R-16028 at the price of $255,000 and within the terms of the agreement of purchase and sale. Also that Council give direction to staff with respect to a current legal proceeding at the Ontario Land Tribunal. Okay, well, we've got Councillor uh, Thompson moved it. Councillor Peter Angel seconded the uh, in-camera ratification. We'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, that's unanimous. And new business. Now, it's funny. It says notice of motion, new business. Now, we have it twice. Do we have it? No, you, you just didn't look at the updated version of the agenda. Oh, <laughs> I just read what's we put in front it. of me. Okay, all right. So, is there any new business? Yes, Councillor Lococo. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. This past week, I had the opportunity to meet with Victoria from AMD for Hope Support Ukraine. She's working with um, many rotary clubs within our community and in, in the region to help support um, refugees here in Niagara Falls that have come from Ukraine or people in the Ukraine. So they're working on um, getting medical supplies, shipping those supplies to the Ukraine. They're working on um, clothing and food for people here and for there. And um, I talked to her and I wondered what she would be looking for for the city. We're looking for some sort of support. So I did reach out to the CAO and um, I was wondering if we could on our website put some links to the Facebook and website of this group because a lot of people want to help with the Ukraine but they don't know what to do or where to go. So if we can put that information on the website and our social media, that would be very helpful. And then I was also wondering through the CAO, to, with his discretion, if he can offer things um, <coughs> like even with our, our staff, maybe to volunteer, to help sort or pack, <coughs> places to store items, event spaces to bring the refugees together. Uh, if anybody would like to help with grant writing, they need some grant writers. Um, 
They also need some help with parking around the church. It's the church across the street from the Niagara Falls Museum on Sylvia Place. So those are some things that um, they're, they're looking for help, and I was wondering through the um, support of council if we could give direction to staff to help us out in those areas. Okay, so uh, maybe we'll get a motion from Council Lococo that we support the Ukrainian um, support through our social media and our website, and also that with the, sta with the CAO's discretion, uh, you know, they can direct staff to support it. Seconded by Councillor Strange. Is there any discussion to the motion? Okay, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, that's unanimous. Thank you for that. Any other new business? Okay, the bylaws. First, second, and third reading. Motion by Councillor Peter Angelo. Second. second by Councillor Thompson to give the bylaws a first, second, and third reading. All those in favor? It's approved. We are now looking for a motion for adjournment. Motion by Councillor Thompson, second by Councillor Patel. All those in favor. And thank you. We're adjourned. We'll see you next Tuesday for our budget meeting.